I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Welcome to another edition of I Mix What I Like right here on Black Power Media. Again, I'm Jared Ball. Very happy to be your host. Looking forward to yet another boom bap breakfast. So definitely reach out. Let everybody know you're here, those who are live. And <clears throat> as Ear Doctor says, uh, tell a friend to tell a friend to come on in. Uh, like Math Hoffa on his platform says, get in here. Get in here. Uh, please do definitely like, share, subscribe, uh, all those good things. Uh, support the channel. Uh, as you know, you can tweet it out, like, share, subscribe, join if you can. Uh, as uh, apparently Wayne Curtis has, and we welcome Wayne. Uh, so we appreciate that. Um and again, folks who are here already, uh, Julie, shout out to you, Vergis, uh, and uh, Bat Black Alliance for Peace. Uh, welcome. And, you know, please do get your questions ready. Uh, Professor Reed will be here at nine o'clock uh, and we'll get started with him uh, then. So if you have questions, uh, please, because um, uh, I've read at least most of the book. Um but I have, you know, but my questions will be more uh, just to ask him to explain, which I'm not sure how he did or how he, I would like him to explain his conclusions. That's all. So anyway, so please do, uh, if you have questions or comments, get them ready as well. Um, and again, welcome to everybody who's here live now. Good morning and greetings. And to those who are here and see this later on all of your favorite podcast platforms. Greetings and peace to you as well, and welcome. Uh, I don't know if folks were aware of this, uh, and I can't remember if he said this on air or not, but just in case those who are, are wondering, uh, unfortunately, life and work schedules have, uh, uh, at least for a while, snatched away Brother Kaaba from us on Friday. So, um, you know, uh, at least for the time being, everyone will have to survive and, and uh, uh, struggle through uh, which, with me uh, solo, at least for the time being, until people like Jackie and others pop in from time to time. You know how it is. And until the remix goes five days a week, so which I know I'm eager to see happen. But anyway, um, a couple of things to get to before Professor Reed gets here, though, that I uh, uh, that I think will will uh, be nice introductory work and preparation. Um, a couple of uh, one sort of one story was sent to me that's actually pretty interesting to me on a number of different levels that we can sort of get started with. Uh, and again, yes, greetings, everybody. Good to see you all. I mean, I'm saying Netf, Netf, you know, there's a number of people, you know, so let's just be clear, Leah and others. There's a number of people uh so that if you don't see them here more often, is is that's on them. And Netf is, you know, a busy brother involved with every single radical and revolutionary formation uh probably happening on the planet and uh doesn't have as much time but but there's a couple people him included that have standing open invitations uh that for whatever reason they they are not able to accept as often as as i or we might like so you know uh <laughs> anyway yeah that's a good you know that's that's legit too um <laughs> Yes, indeed. Right on, Big Teal. Uh, no, I'm, I, I just started the stream a little early because to, just to, so we can actually start the show right on time and let people start to you know filter in a little earlier. Uh, that's all. That's all. Um, greetings, 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 greetings. Um, anyway, so one of these stories uh, that was that that um, was was recently sent to me is uh, this one here, which 
I'm moved by on a number of different levels. One, because it says here that a mixtape changed Seventh Woods' life at 14. Years later, he's picking up the pieces. Um, so on the one hand, it's a story about the the power of, of, of mixtapes. And I have a particular uh, um, historic love affair with mixtapes. But the other is, is that it's, 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 you know, in some ways it's, it's, a, it's an, it's a moving story. Uh, in some other ways, it's kind of, I hate to say it this way, but it, it kind of just reminds me of what a lot of commercial media like to do to tell that, you know, came from the hood and now we hear stories, um, you know, only in America and all that. But the other reason is, is that it focuses on Morgan State's uh, uh, woods, uh, 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 Seventh Woods. Uh, so we got Morgan State in the news. Uh, and uh, uh, playing ball over, uh, you know, at Morgan State. So, um, you know. So they're talking about the hip hop, the the hoops, the 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 mixtape, the hip hip mixtape, like you know the whatever. I don't know. Anyway, so anyway, that was just it. Just mixtapes and 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 Morgan State. That's all. So congratulations. I hope you know. Anyway, not much for me to say there. I I just liked it. <laughs> um, the other thing. Oh, man, and I don't have it. Oh, my goodness, I didn't cue it up. That's my bad, everybody. Did you all see, there's been a lot of, you know, you know, the 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 war, uh, this Ukraine-Russia piece has, of course, is horrible. Um, but I, I will say it has produced, you know, you know, the dialectic, of course, is is that it produces these really good uh uh i mean obviously it produces you know what we get is the the, the we, we 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 always have to deal with the um you know the dominant uh, imposed propaganda narrative etc and so forth and, and we get a lot of bad takes and analyses but on the other hand the flip side is we've been getting a lot of brilliant analyses um so obviously the daruba ajamu talk that kalanji hosted stands out uh, you know, obviously we've talked about here before, uh, uh, Ramiro Sebastian Funes stands out, uh, and this conversation that I saw the other day, um, between, you know what, I, I, I didn't cue it up. So, uh, dang, my bad. Um, I don't think I'll be able to find it fast enough, but, oh, I hate when I do that. I really hate when I do that stuff. Um, but the point was, if, 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 if you haven't seen it, um, and I'm sure many of you have, but if you haven't seen it, there was this, this, so at least we'll, I'll at least show the, 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 you know, put a little, the, uh, you know, show the video, you know, put it up on screen at least here, but, but, but there was this incredible, I think an incredible discussion between Brian Becker and Eugene Perrier, who of course have worked together for a long time with the answer coalition party for socialism and liberation. Um, and 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 you know beyond but uh i just thought that they had this really really good conversation about you know the, the whole crisis and one of the, the clip that i would have wanted to play and I'll, I'll probably end up coming back to it at some point um uh but i'll at least mention it here and, and describe a little bit of what they what they what they said but uh because the note i have here is that you know that this is another reason why we need the after party concept or why i think the 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 idea broadly speaking of the after party is such a good one because um the the overriding theme uh that i took away from this conversation is that we need uh, we need of course to be organized and to be prepared with an analysis so that we're not caught off guard when these crises occur and that we're not caught unaware of what to do when these crises occur we know that eventually we don't necessarily know when or where, but we know crises are going to occur because that's the nature of capital and capitalism and imperialism. Um, that's the nature of 
<laughs> U.S. foreign policy. So, so a lot of what they do here is, of course, resetting the narrative so that we're reminded of the history that led up to Russia's actions. And none of us are saying what, what Putin is doing is, is fully correct. We're not saying that Russia is fully right. We're not saying we want to see people invade and da 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 none of that stuff. But uh, um, they, they have, and there is a need to reset the narrative to remind of what happened in, in advance of this, that there is a history that predates this from the creation of the Ukraine to, to the, encro the, 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 uh, ever, uh, um, the overstepping, the perpetual line stepping of NATO, uh, and so on and so forth. But one of the points that, that Brian ends up bringing up in this, that I thought was really important for, for us to have, uh, as, as a sort of benchmark to consider is that they talk about in this discussion, the uh, common turn around the first world war, the communist international around uh, at the uh, uh, prior to the first world war. And um, what Brian Becker it, it talks about is that there was a discussion among those member participants in the common turn that the socialist and working world of Europe or the, the socialists and working, yeah, the, well, socialists and working people of Europe would not support their individual countries in in uh, uh, engagement or um, involvement in a world war. Uh, with the idea that if 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 the bourgeoisie and the 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 leadership of these countries wants to go into an imperial war with one another, they'll have to fight it on their own. That working people, the socialist world, was not going to join in and 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 slaughter each other for their masters. But of course, as the war came, you know, as as the war took effect and took off, all of those promises fell apart. The principles fell apart. The you know, people lost their principles, lost their nerve, whatever fell fell into the propaganda of we have to save our nation, whatever it was. And I thought, and, and so his point was that this that today's socialist community needs to have an analysis of the relationship of socialists and working people to the state, to capital, and to the machines of war. Obviously. The African world needs to do the same, has to have its own pre-existing analysis, organized, uh, principled response uh, that can both be, you know, or, uh, developed and organized and I guess thirdly put into practice better than that. So it, it, so. Anyway, I'll, I'll, if I haven't already, I'll make sure the link to this is in the show notes. And I really encourage people to check out this discussion. It's one of the best that that, that I've heard. And it offers so many gems to be expanded into uh, certainly the Pan-African world uh, uh, or or as a, as a baseline for how we need to be thinking about how we engage with electoral politics, how we engage with the state, how we engage with the state's media apparatus, with calls to go to war, so on and so on and so on. Uh, because as we've already talked about, uh, whether it was Kaba and myself or others we've had on the platform, even just even we are the ones that get plucked into to uh, uh, to service. And as as Brian was talking about in terms of the socialists and working people of of, the, of Europe and in, in up in before World War One, they were even having. I mean, to, to think, I, I, you know, I don't know this history that well, but to think that they were having these organ these these international conversations among working people and socialists and saying, you know, with a with a level of clarity, we can't support our countries getting into this. And then they ended up doing it, as, as I think, and then killing each other <laughs> is, is, I think, something that is is worth uh, revisiting. Um Anyway, so again, I apologize for I, I thought I had it queued up and I and I don't. So, but uh, I'll happily come back to it at another point. But anyway, that was the the gist of of what Brian was talking about in that clip. I wanted to to share and what I uh, would have wanted us to to um, uh, consider, you know, for our own purposes uh, and theirs as well. I mean, I actually think that 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 uh, obviously, I think we should be involved with. Um, Again, almost the same way I think we should be engaging electoral politics. I think we should be engaging, you know, broader the, the international um, socialist and labor struggles, all of that. I think we need to be involved in all of that stuff. 
uh, but as as again a pre-organized and clear uh, base, so to speak. So uh, another story I was going to have some fun with this morning, but I think I'm actually I actually have made a note to bring up um, with with Adolph Reed, but I'm going to I'm just going to bring it up here because I, I might end up forgetting during our discussion, and even when I have notes, I don't always get to them. But uh, it's interesting that that um, where I live in Maryland is uh again being said to be among one of the happiest cities to live in in the country um a study by wallet hub ranked happiest american cities using a combined score of several metrics although one city in maryland made it to, to the top of the list some cities in virginia and washington dc ranked pretty low the study found that columbia maryland is the second happiest city in america bested only by fremont california out of 182 cities so my city, uh, I, I was born in Washington, D.C., happy and proud of that, and uh, but but uh, did not grow up there and only went back to live there as an adult and uh, um, later on. But I grew up and live now out here in Columbia, Maryland, the second happiest city. But as we'll get to with, with uh, I hope to bring up with Professor Reed uh, in response to one of the points that he made, um, by the way, Baltimore was ranked 149th out of 182, Detroit uh, 182, dead last, and D.C. 85. Uh, Washington, D.C. ranked second, and Columbia, Maryland ranked third in the cities with the lowest suicide rates. So that's good to know. Uh, the top Virginia city on the list, Virginia Beach. Uh, that's interesting because my experience with Virginia Beach was some fun admittedly but uh you know a lot of um segregation and hostility as well anyway but uh um but the point that i'm i'm interested that, that in response to to uh adolf reed's um what he claims in his book about the end of jim crow and the improved world we live in is that this is sort of the point that i i think is important to make that in the post jim crow era uh, or or the post de jure Jim Crow era, there is a de facto Jim Crow that still exists um, that is more nuanced and sophisticated and I think pernicious and therefore in some ways difficult to assess. Uh, and Columbia, Maryland is a perfect example of this. Some might remember, um, uh, I, you know, I even made a little video about it. I should, I should you know, we should bring that back up again where I, you know, I showed the neighborhood I grew up in in Columbia. And again, it's not, you know, the 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 the, the pissy hallway projects and all that. It, it's certainly not to, to to compare to that. But the point that that Columbia that I was trying to make about Columbia that I think is evident in even in this recent story here is that Columbia has always been claimed to be a more or less racial and class utopia designed to be that way. Uh, but what it ends up doing is creating in a microcosm the broader societal, it just replicates the broader society in microcosm. So you have parts of this, the city where I grew up that are uh, uh, subsidized housing. They are, you know, designed so that the that working people do not need transportation to get to their shopping centers and all that kind of churches and all that stuff. Every, every you know, it's designed that way. Uh, uh, but then almost immediately, a, you know, a, a street or two down, you start having uh, more middle income housing and then upper middle class housing and then upper class housing. Um, and the children, theoretically, of all these people, uh, all these all these different groups, class groups, uh, uh, which deter end up being racial groups, because my neighborhood um I would have a joke. My mother and the white woman that had a black son living uh, on the floor beneath us or were the only white people in the neighborhood that I, for the most part, that I can remember growing up. Uh, so it was a very black neighborhood at the time. Now it's more more POC diverse, but still non-white. Um, and and uh, uh, with higher levels of security now, as I showed in the the, the video that I, I made, I'll put the link to that in the show notes here as well, uh, where I went back to my old neighborhood and 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 you know it's it's and uh, um, uh, anyway, uh, but 
but the real point that I'm I'm building here too is that um, as we'll come and I'm likely to come back to in the next hour is that recent studies have also showed that while yes Columbia Maryland may in fact be a happy city to live in it also is among the uh, most segregated in terms of public schooling particularly in terms of uh, advanced placement classes so for instance what ends up happening is like our children have uh, particularly in 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 their early elementary school years were in uh, almost exclusively black and brown schools because the the uh the redistricting the rezoning the sort of uh, a new form of white flight where the richest of the white communities have moved and extended Columbia, Maryland into a new section of Columbia that is the first to have no low income housing in it, to have uh, almost no, uh, what they call multifamily units now, or, or what we used to call apartments, um, and have these palatial estates with, you know, with, um, uh, in, in other words, they created this own separate section for themselves. So, yeah, you will see black and white people together at the mall and on the bus and wherever, wherever, wherever. But there still is this lived and educational segregation at rates that that rival uh, uh, those in, in the de jure segregation era. So this idea that we can't be extending analyses from then to now is 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 shocking to me. Um, and I'd, I'd like to look more, I didn't look closely enough at how that study was conducted, but I'd, I'd actually like to see a little bit more of what was done there because, uh, one of the many, uh, uh, aborted projects that I started some years ago was to, to, to do an, an update on, on Columbia, Maryland's, um, uh, experience because when you, you know, even in the preliminary research I was doing, um, uh, almost within the first 10 to two, within the first decade or, or certainly within the first two decades of Columbia, Maryland's existence built in, I, I believe the late sixties, uh, officially, uh, almost immediately there black communities were saying this, this isn't, what you all promised uh and certainly having seen over the you know the change over the years we see that that there's been more of a um uh uh shift away politically from uh community and utopian fantasies to just more conservative right wing uh get what you can get and let's let's gentrify and advance and then even even where i've experienced uh being around the the black bourgeoisie and and literally walked away <laughs> i remember at a soccer practice one time uh, uh a black mother uh was i overheard her she was next to me talking and i think she was trying to say this in a way to bring me in because she saw that 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 our kids were like the only black kids on the on the field um i think she was trying to bring me into the conversation but her point when the conversation was to say uh, essentially that, that that standard black bourgeois thing, like we moved out here to get away from the hood. I don't want to help the hood come out here by uh, uh, supporting an expansion of public. It was like, the, it was like, it was, it was, it, in fact, it was what Dave Chappelle was being falsely accused of in the last couple of weeks. She was sitting there saying, I don't, I don't, I don't want, you know, I don't want more, you know, uh, you know, I don't want more uh, um, low income housing. I left, I left, you know, we got out of those areas. I don't want to have to live around those, you know, I don't want them coming out here after we got away from them. And um, I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was kind of like a throwaway, like, you know, like, I don't know, like, I'm not going to, I'm not, in, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not in agreeing, but I'm not, I don't want to get into it with you. And I just kind of walked away. Um, but so anyway, that's, that stuff is still going on out here as well. So, I mean, you know, um, anyway, so we'll likely come on back to that. We'll come on back to that. All right. A uh, couple other things to, to, let me move on here. Um, a couple of, of other things. So the other day, uh, or last week, I think we did, we did a segment talking about, um, Biden's SCOTUS nominee who have, had, was, has now since been nominated. I, had she already been nominated or I think we, we she had already been nominated, uh, Katanji. Brown Jackson, 
And uh, we uh, and I suggested through uh, uh, one of the other stories that I pulled up that that uh, it didn't look like she was going to you, you know be in position or or was was situated to make you know some radical uh, impact on the court and therefore some have some radical impact on our lives. It just it just wasn't. And I remember somebody in one of the comments on the on YouTube on the YouTube um, on on that clip uh, was you know suggesting like you didn't really look at her record you know like but what about her record though you know there was you know an illusion you know the story we talked about had sort of alluded to her 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 record uh and um you know praised her her public defender background uh of course that she's a black woman and would be able to bring a different worldview to the and um uh and that the one point that i remember we brought up was that she is known to have for writing for taking a long time to write her decisions and to have them be very long decisions and in one point the decision she wrote uh, that was supposed to be criticizing a Trump decision allowed Trump to get away with whatever he was trying to do because her decision took so long to produce. So since then, and I, and I think uh, it's likely that, that at least some of you, if not many of you have seen this, but uh, it has come out that um, it, at least in one instance, uh, uh, um, a noted retired federal judge UW Clemen had written to uh, back in early February to President Biden, uh, say with a warning, with a warning. So, as uh, Judge Clement writes. Dear Mr. President, as one who has labored in the vineyards of civil rights all his life, I rejoice in your determination to appoint the first black female to the United States Supreme Court. In the tradition of Thurgood Marshall, hopefully she will stand tall for equal justice for all and equality in the workplace. As you consider the candidates for your legacy appointment to the highest court of the land, it is entirely appropriate for you to take into account not simply what each aspirant has done for her own career, but equally so what she has done for the cause of justice and equality. Based on her conduct in Ross versus Lockheed, I strongly believe that circuit court Circuit Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson should not be appointed by you as the first black female justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. The Ross case was brought as a 2016 class action on behalf of 5,500 black workers of Lockheed Martin Corporation, the nation's largest federal contractor. Before filing the lawsuit, lawyers for the black plaintiffs negotiated a settlement with Lockheed Martin, which provided for a reformed evaluation system, the cornerstone of pay and promotion decisions, and $22 million to be distributed to the black workers. When the lawyers presented the settlement to Judge Jackson, she incredibly refused to approve the settlement because in her view, there were no common factual questions. Then more incredibly, she denied the plaintiff their fundamental right to take discovery of Lockheed Martin's books and records as they sought to prove class action status. Finally, by taking 54 days to issue her memorandum opinion accompanying her order, denying class certification, she effectively aborted plaintiff's rights to appeal her class certification decision under Rule 23F of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So Judge Jackson in Ross, one, gave the axe to a settlement designed to benefit numerous black workers at one of the nation's largest employers. Two, denied the injunctive relief agreed to by Lockheed Martin that would have addressed a root cause of systemic racial bias that could have been a model for a nation hungry for racial equity solutions. Three, denied black, the black workers the right to seek evidence to prove their claim of company-wide racial discrimination. And four, knowingly frustrated the rights of black workers to appeal her decision. So again, I am by no means a legal expert, but here is uh, at least one letter from one who, at least nominally we would think is a legal expert, who has said that um, <laughs> she's not helpful. <laughs> I think it's fair to say, I think, uh, you know, it's fair to say that, that he feels she's not, she's not helpful. Um, Is this what? Yeah, 
imperial wealth redistribution. So, so obviously, so like everything, and and I, I, I feel Emma's point here. I think if I, you know, is that I mean, this is everything we're talking about is redistributing the spoils of imperial aggression. Um, at the end of the day, so even even you know even my own uh, watered down. Uh, argument around redistributing the GDP is is just that redistribution of the spoils of war. Um, admittedly, for for as a step, but you know, uh, but yeah, that's absolutely it. Um, yeah, the letter is fire, uh, and it didn't work. Surprise, spoiler alert! It didn't work. Uh, she did, in fact, get nominated. Um, and as we played in the in the video last week, a lot of uh, particularly the black commercial press is championing it with this whole you know black girl magic thing. Um, yeah, that's the least not helpful is the least. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, peace, Geechee. Peace, peace, peace. Greetings to you. Hope all is is at least getting better. Um, I don't know if that's possible, but. Anyway, um, I just yeah. So I I just wanted to share that a little bit. That 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 was uh, I think a, a, a again the same issue where she writes these long decisions that end up in in the Trump issue that we raised last week contradict what her claim position would be. This one just was an additional, you know, knife. In, in 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 the back so to speak of of i'm not only disagreeing with you i'm not only i'm not only refusing your award but i'm going to take so long in my refusal that you can't even appeal that's that's gangster like that's that's that is almost feels like that's the kind of like that's that sibling loved one violence and pain like like the people that know you most can do the most damage. That's what that feels like. Like that added little, uh, speaking of which, speaking of which, the ones that are supposed to know you most do the most damage. Um, uh, my, 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 my girl, my ace, Maggie Anderson is back. So Maggie Anderson, so clearly this is the issue with Maggie Anderson and her husband. Uh, with this whole my black year nonsense, um, which I did end up buying and reading. And it's it's just it's just because if I'm going to talk about you, I got to at least read some of your work, at least some of it. And it's just horrible. But and I've and I've and, and I'll put the link and I'm not going to belabor the point this morning. The in, in the video I did last year about um, about Maggie Anderson. Uh, and Dr. King did not support buying black because she completely, she's either lying or just is so woefully ignorant of the history that she's, she, she's just mistaken. So she's either lying or woefully mistaken, but either way, she should not be invited to talk to anyone about economics or race or Dr. King. That's because the, 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 the argument is nonsense. Uh, two black with with a little bit of assistance from me uh, already showed, and I'll put the link to that video there. That, that her claims and other people's claims about the circulating black dollar are false. We already went through and bust that up. Her claims about buying power, I feel like I've bust up, but I can't, you know, stop. I can't stop the the the, the waves of propaganda. Uh, they just keep on coming. Um, in part because even people that know the work. Don't read the work, don't share the work, and or misrepresent the work. <laughs> that that that's part of the problem. I have to I have to admit. I have to admit it's part of the problem. But she's back again on this episode. We hear from Bernard Bronner, president and CEO of Bronner Bros, one of the largest Black-owned beauty companies in the U.S. Then Carla sits down with author and activist Maggie Anderson to talk about her year of buying black, and and uh, again. I, 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 you know, I won't belabor it too much, but what do you, what do you get in, in, um, 
this 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 year of buying black you get more of the mythology about a black circulating dollar you get more of the mythology about the the power of the black consumer to support black businesses and then therefore the power of those black businesses to in turn support black communities you get a whole bunch of black class ignorance so you get a story about affluent uh, an affluent black couple who has the the privilege and the ability plus the incentive through some bad research that we've exposed in that other video i'll put the link in the in the show notes here uh uh to to make a claim that they went around the country for a year supporting black businesses as often as they could as much as they could and what you realize of course is everything that we've been arguing there's no such thing as circulating dollar there's no buying power there's no uh, ability to to scale up businesses black businesses to become big enough to support the black community in ways to generate enough revenue to change the material conditions of the black community none of that so, but then she just comes back and then last year she really went in and did the thing of where even dr king knew that it was the black business community that supported the civil rights struggle and therefore he was a, a pro a, a, big, a big proponent of buying black etc and so forth which i show in great detail is exactly the opposite of what he said because what he said was buying black and banking black and all that stuff doesn't work and what we need is political power his version you know he said it a bit differently which was we just need federal government to get involved and redistribute the wealth which is factual uh i, I prefer the phrase political power because it's intentionally vague on the one hand but it meant specifically not to mean supporting the democrat or republican status quo electoral process but <sighs> there it is again um, and it, and also, by the way, uh, um, uh, buying power had a big week this week. Uh, my Google alerts were off the charts. So I'll just share one more example of uh, where, you know, the, the, the Maggie Andersons get their support. Um, but again, it's the same thing. Here's Nielsen right back. Following years of underinvestment, marketers like General Motors, Target, Coca-Cola, and Verizon are shifting more ad dollars to Black-owned and Black-targeted media. Recent data shows the U.S. Black population, which represents nearly $1.6 trillion, $1 trillion of buying power, spends more time with media than any other group, blah, 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 blah. So we've already gone through all of this. I just wanted to bring this up again. Um, it's, it's, it's reading a little more in honesty. It, re it reads a little more honest. Whoops. It reads a little more honestly here than than when it gets picked up in the black press. But but what it's saying here is that this is a, a method. Again, the whole point is to capture the six hundred billion dollars spent every year in ad revenue from these major corporations. It's not a mark. It's not a measure of actual economic strength. And one of the problems, as we pointed out, even with Roland Martin's show, is that when everything is sponsored by Verizon, Coca-Cola and McDonald's, you get some really strange and silly mcdonald's gospel christmas events that we talked about last year and, and more importantly and worse more worse is that you get horrific economic analysis that is entirely mythological uh anti-historical and anti-factual about again the power of the black dollar the power of black capitalism and entrepreneurialism to change anything um uh Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, seeing, believing, meeting, black, uh, why did I pull this up? Because the connection, there's a connection here between uh, what, let me, let me just share this real quick. Why did I, but, but Because connected to this, within that initial story is um, reference to um, this page here, and I made a note about publicist, but not because publicist is an advertising company. Let's see, seeing market is believe in his industry looks more black storytellers move their brand awareness to black audiences. A deeper understanding of the community is increasingly critical. Uh, wait a minute. Where is that on the page? Publicis. Where is that though? 
Okay, right, right. Okay, that's what I was looking for. Charlotte Polite Corley, Nielsen's VP in Diverse Insights Partnerships, Ashanti and Ashanti James, VP Director of for Citibank and Publicist New York. Right. Okay, that's what I. That, that's why. Uh, because the the if if folks remember, I've I've talked about this before when we talk more about the ad uh, and marketing community. Publicist is one of the major. Um, ad companies that is, uh, I believe I was bringing them up recently because they're 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 um, behind a lot of the cryptocurrency marketing happening right now. So I thought it was just interesting that we have Ashanti James who works for Citibank and publicists, you know, so coming from the banking and marketing community is involved in promoting this this buying power mythology uh, with Nielsen. Uh, and helping to again to bring ad revenue to black commercial media, which then gets reported as economic and political power. Um, so that's what it was. It's this, this again, this incestuous banking and advertising community that is um, <sighs> driving the economic analysis that that many in our community uh, keep going back to. You know, um, okay, so I think I did it again on this one too, uh, that I did not properly prepare. Dang, my bad, everybody. I, I this is this is, um, uh, hold on. Because there have been so many, I don't know. All right, let me back this up. So there have been more. All right, so there's been a number of, oh, my bad, everybody, damn. So let me just move it up here. I'll skip a little bit of this. So there's been a whole bunch of just this year alone. Uh, just this year alone, uh, just since the, the calendar year of 2022, there have been, um, I want to say dozens already, uh, crypto and NFT scams and rug pulls. Uh, and again, you know, rug pulls, because it's going to be mentioned here in case anybody is, is unaware, is just where uh, a, a currency or an NFT is offered or any product is offered. Uh, people bring in investment and then they run off with the money. They pull the rug out from from the investors and run off and disappear with the money. And it's just happening more and more and more and more and more and more and more. So my new favorite uh, um, white outlet, uh, uh, R.M. Brown. Uh, covered a little bit of this, and I just want to play a little bit of 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 his discussion because it includes a reference to a new uh, for me a new a uh, uh, newly found Twitter account that I think is of great value um, in monitoring uh, and keeping up with all this because there's just been so many. So this whole video he did is about several of the, the the scams that have occurred this year. I just want to play a little bit of of this one here, real quick. I could still invest in this one, man. Look at this. It's called the Jacked Ape Club. Again, this is all just in February. The Jacked Ape, Ape Club. And these people made out with $1.4 million doing this. So, so they said, hey, you know that ape thing Jimmy Kimmons was talking about on there? <laughs> well, <laughs> this one's like that, but they're jacked. They're jacked, dude. So they, these guys said they had 8,888 of these apes for sale <laughs> they only sold 3200 of these of this 888 that uh, the you know 8888 blah 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 they only sold 3000 so they burned the remaining supply and told everyone that it was completely sold out then 13 different wallets received big payouts totaling 1.4 million worth of crypto leaving just 530 dollars in the project I mean, so this is how it works. You just get people, you you know, you you spam this stuff out into the internet and be like, this is the next big thing. People invest in it. You take the money and you're like, goodbye. Bye. We'll just take this money that you were trying to, uh, you were trying to make, you were trying to turn into more money, but we're just going to keep it. <laughs> 
Also, I found out a good place to uh, find out about this stuff is a Twitter account called Web3 is Going Just Great. Um, and it's a lot of these kind of – because this this scam stuff is just going all over the crypto thing. With It's funny because that Larry David ad where he's like – you know, he's like, oh, the wheel sucks. Oh, all this sucks. The whole message of that ad was like, don't miss out. Don't miss out on this. So a lot of people do feel like I can't miss out on this. If I miss out on this, I'm a moron and I'm losing money. So that's driving a lot of these people getting just a scam or rude. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop it there. But that's that was just, you know, uh uh and I hope, I hope, Big Teal, you're not suggesting that my discussion of crypto is like Muzak. That would be, that would be entirely trifling, but funny on a little bit, a little bit funny. Uh, anyway, um, but related to that is also, because I know we talked the, uh, a couple of weeks ago about, uh, again, how uh, my, I keep making the argument, new technology, new media does not change social relationships. And we've already seen how women go into the metaverse and get, groped and all whatever kind of stuff so it's like the the the, the well well there's there's something i don't i don't know i certainly missed this maybe many of you did not miss it but um well it speaks for itself slavery in the 21st century many of us would think of slavery as slavery to technology slavery to our devices my biggest worry as being a person who's grown up in both the 20th and the 21st century the last generation to play outside i worry that technology has made us less empathetic towards real human emotions and the human experience in general with companies such as facebook creating metaverses with users having to create their own characters and avatars in which they can't exclude the imperfections of their real life in a way technology might be genuinely getting in the way of people's abilities to be able to create authentic connections with each other since being empathetic demands that you step outside of oneself but how might this phenomenon of us having our devices in our hands and access to social media at all times impact the experience of being human should we be wary of technology's rapid rise well i personally never thought that i would live to see the day that the meta human being be auctioned off for ownership like in the slave trade of the mid 17th century well that is exactly what happened with the meta slave nfts which had black people across the globe absolutely enraged but you've probably not even heard about it because it was not so promptly removed the selling of computer generated black people with assigned numbers auctioned off to the highest bidder but are these just pictures of black people for sale or is it something far more sinister as technology Anyway, just a little clip of that. I'll put the full link to that video if, if folks want to see it in the, in the show notes. But uh, um, I just, it, I think it speaks for itself. Uh, and and part of what she says in that, that she says one of the reasons that some people might not have heard of it was that there was a campaign to not talk about it, apparently, to give it value and to to, to boost the, the value. But since it's been pulled and, and, and removed, uh, it's now safe to bring up, but it just seems, you know, okay, as soon as as soon as there's an opportunity for for a new a new expansion of the of the old of the old ways, it it, it, it you know, it, it, let's you know, let's get people to to buy NFTs of digitally constructed enslaved black people. I mean, it's 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 bananas. Um. So I, yeah, I just, you know, yeah. Um, one more thing that I just wanted to share a, for a little bit of, of, actually from that same video producer is, is, is that she did a video about Tyra Banks uh, that I thought was interesting because it, it included a lot of stuff I had never, you know, I never just paid attention to, but I just want to play this little clip because I think actually that inadvertently Tyra Banks once upon a time uh solved our still uh whatever lingering issues we have with colorism in the black community uh and so i just want to i just thought this was interesting that women of color are beautiful too you know they see that 
We have this dark skin. It's different. It's odd. You know, we have what they say, 48 shades in our ethnic, in African American women. You know, and so um, whereas Caucasians have 12 shades, so it gives us a little more of diversity. So there's, you know, I mean, you may see someone really, really, really pale and really, really dark, and it just, it's just so beautiful. And I think designers are realizing that. So. In the, it was in, it was initially said in the context of of they're not you know of hi, historically and probably still today uh, modeling agencies not wanting to hire black women because weren't marketable and that this was apparently changing at some point I guess that was in the early nineties whatever uh, but I just thought it was interesting I had not really heard it put that way that 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 we have forty eight shades forty eight shades of blackness that that create this 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 perfect beauty. Now, of course, the video goes on to talk about how Tyra Banks uh, apparently has, uh, I did not know any, I don't know anything about any of this, but apparently she has had a longstanding issue with uh, Naomi Campbell and and other dark-skinned Black women models uh, who have apparently taken on the brunt of her vitriol over the years. So un unfortunately, she was not able to uphold her own argument there, apparently, but I just thought that was pretty interesting. I just I, I had honestly never heard that you know forty eight shades of beauty what a, what a, what a great way of of uh, you know initially putting it um, so that was it that's all that I had in advance so we have a couple minutes before Professor Reed gets here so yes as as uh, I forgot who who said it but yeah this is just me being an opening act. Um, but I did see a question or a comment that I did want to respond to if I could find it again. Um, and again, this this, you know, Anthony, I, I think you've made this point before and it's constantly brought up in response to my criticisms about buying power. And and it, it, it's again, this isn't the point that I'm I'm making. The, the, in fact, the if I am to, to extend this this point, it's to say that the argument to support our own has been and is being constantly abused. By black capitalists who have no real interest in a collective advance uh, and then who use this that we have to support our own as as a, a sort of browbeating mechanism uh, and a way to, 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 I think, deflect. I'm not saying you are doing this, but I think it's used to deflect against the argument and the analysis. So I'm not saying, of course, it, it's not a question of should we or shouldn't we support our own. The question is, to what extent is our supporting our own through consumption actually supporting our own? And I'm saying it's not. So if you want to support your local black owned business or your friend's own business or whatever, that's fine. And I would I'd have no problem with that. I'm not discouraging that. But it does not help us collectively, is my point. So it's so the only. Uh, um broader value to supporting our own is is the the general ethic the principle the 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 i don't know early stages of organizational development is just the basic willingness to support each other and i get that so it's of course important but the problem is that that people consist, consistently start with that basic point and extrapolate this fantasy that if you support me that is in fact supporting you automatically or that it can be done to an extent that the collective will be um, uh, taken care of, and I just don't think. And again, I have to say that in that the debate with the 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 the, um, the, the gentleman of crypto, I think by the end of the debate it was pretty clear, and I think that they represented the ethic I'm talking about. That it's really not about it's going to be good for the collective because as they kept saying, not everybody going to make it. And if you don't want to, if you don't get down and I don't care and I don't care about the environment and I don't care, you know, like there was no, there's no, it's, it's, it's so they are, it's that same kind of, you know, um, all right, now look at, now look here, I'm, look here, everybody. I'm not trying to get offended. I, I, you know, I am sensitive about my, sh and I'm not trying to get offended by all these these questions about when when Reed is going to get here. I already done said that. If you only hear from Professor Reed, you know what I'm saying, you are missing out anyway. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, my memory is some garbage, hot garbage. I don't know what the context was of that, but it's, it's a, so Reed, Professor Reed is going to be here in se seven minutes. He's scheduled to be here at nine o'clock. 
So if that's the only reason why you're here, then just hold your horses or come on back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm not being petty. I'm just saying. I'm sensitive. Everybody keep asking about. No, I'm just playing. No, he'll be here. He'll he, he's scheduled to be here in a few minutes. Um uh and I don't mind I don't mind being an opening act. Um yeah, that's it too. That's that's it too. That part is I think the young people say that part. Or 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 say more. I don't I don't I'm not up on all the latest on the latest. Um so anyway, um yeah, we do have some new new names and faces in here. So look, I mean, this is what we do. I know some of you are just here to wait for Professor Reed, but this is what we do. Uh, these are the conversations, the topics we address on a regular basis uh, and in this more or less way. So, uh, and I think quite unlike most other platforms. So uh, like, join, subscribe, hit the share button, invite others to jump on in here uh, and uh, join the conversation as well. Uh, so buying Jordans and supporting black. <laughs> uh, by the way, I just saw the best uh, video yesterday that I've ever seen uh, that gets into the 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 analytics of why <laughs> of why that's messed up to of why Jordan is the goat. Uh, um, a full breakdown of the numbers and all that other stuff. If if you needed uh, um, uh, evidence that that uh you know on the court he's he's the goat uh still to this day his numbers he's still at the top of all the analytic statistics uh for production as a player even years after retirement uh dr jared if we continue to operate as separate as the digits instead of lockstep uh as the fist the small gains of supporting our owns will never be affected that's a fact and that's why i'm saying political organization is the precursor to anything we have to be or it doesn't and that's sort of what I, my point is nothing we do absent a sort of a, a already established organization is going to be effective that was the point i was making trying to make about brian becker's statements about the common turn in world war one and the socialist breakdown uh uh it, it's the same thing i make about the after party it's the same thing i'm making about spending consumption whatever we're doing you know the the it has to be on a uh, 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 it has to be organized. It has to be done with a certain level of political clarity that I, I don't think currently exists. So um, there should be a subscribe button, um, right on the on the right there underneath the 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 YouTube player. Um, Yeah, ahead of Wilt. Uh, well, actually, no, they couldn't use Wilt because the statistics they were using uh, only started being collected after 1983. Um, so the the uh, um, and I, for, I for, you know, but it's and I forgot what they like, like, what is it like, like. I forgot what all the metrics are, to be honest with you, but but the, the and I'll, I'll I'll actually remember I'll put the link in the show notes uh, after we finish up um because uh it was really well done the video is really really well done and but it, but no they couldn't they couldn't include wilt statistics because they started compiling most of these statistics after 1983 um but they but they do it so that you can they they break it down over a career they break it down over a per game performance they break it down by what could be expected out of the position you're you're in so, you know, they show like, you know, that, that there are some random big men that, that technically have like the best shooting percentages for any player to take out over 500 shots in NBA history. But of course, they're not the best players. And it's because they're standing two feet underneath the rim with putbacks. Uh, um, so they do all of this. And then, and then the, the last uh, there's like six or seven um, variables. And the last one is the eye test. Um, uh, so, so initially it's a comparison between Jordan and LeBron to show that Jordan is by far, I mean, it's, it's even more than I would have thought by far better than LeBron. But when you, but the, but when you start to see when they show where Jordan still ranks after all these years, he's either number one or in the top three in almost every major category ever. So yeah, Wilt would have been a challenge statistically to that. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I have a, I have a bias. 
obviously, but uh, maybe not. I, I think you know. Um, yo, is Shaheen in the, in the joint right now? Peace, Shaheen, my man. Good to see you. Yeah, so so well, so for those who might not have known Shaheen, my man, good to see you again. Peace to you and yours. Uh, um, if anybody, this is part of a legendary South African, the the Wu Tang of South Africa, prophets of the city. Please go. To, anyway, we gotta we gotta have you on. We gotta we gotta wrap Shaheen. Let's let's be in touch, man. But uh, to this point here, we did. Um, I reached out to Gerald Horn. Uh, and he's not interested. He would, he, he wouldn't, I, I absolutely invited him to, 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 uh, debate professor Reed specifically around what Reed has said about the 1619 project, which of course, uh, Horn was uh, a contributor to, uh, and, and, you know, and I'll say this when he's here and he should be here any minute, but, um, uh, I've, I've, you know, and I said it before, like, I don't honestly, like, obviously I have a certain level of arrogance and an ego, but I don't think, I think there are levels to this. And I don't think the the discussion that I'm having with Reed today should be between me and Reed. It should be between Horn and Reed that, that, and they should be willing. And I actually disagree with Horn on his general stance against these kinds of exchanges because um, I, again, it doesn't have to be, I, I don't know that maybe there's something Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He said I didn't send the link. I did send you the link. I sent you the link weeks ago. Or days ago, rather. I did send you the link already. Um, hold on, folks. And I sent it to, to his assistant. Come on now. Um, all right. How do we find this real quick? Uh, Adolf Reed, da, 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 da. great Friday works, excellent. Da, 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 da. Thanks again. All right, where did I put the thing? Da, da, da. Uh, geez. Jeez. All right, let me just, let me just. Resend it. It's not that deep, but mm, mm. um, invite copy. Do do do. Woo woo woo. Woo woo woo. Do do do. Do do do. There it is. Woo woo woo. Ba ba ba. Boop boop. Boop be. Boop boop. Boop be. Boop. boop. Boop, 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 doop, doop, doop. All right, so he should be here any second. But but anyway, yeah. So I think anyway, I think it should be between uh, Horn and Reed. This should be. Uh, it would be that would have been much better. And I don't know, you know, but you know, I, I I don't know about Horn. I don't know him well at all. But I I just know that he's not interested in these kinds of exchanges. And I just don't know. I don't really understand why. Um, and I wish I was closer to him to to get a better understanding of why. Um. I don't really see the what negative comes of this unless there's something personal between them that I don't know. Um yeah, maybe you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying. I think this is a great idea. So I think again, so shout out to Josh and Aaliyah who are uh, working with me on this show. Please send all of these suggestions to I mix what I like booking at gmail.com i mix what i like booking at gmail.com and let's 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 i'm down with it um but uh uh yeah so you know i think that's a great idea um and uh yeah that's funny uh oh, we gotta send links once a day. Look, that's that's what people would assist. Like, well, I, do, I guess I do have assistance, but that's what people with like like real staff do. You know what I'm saying? That's like I couldn't even. I don't. I don't. We don't. I don't. We don't have a budget to for Josh Delia to be imposed on like like that. 
Um, uh, oh, is that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, put a boom back as long as that's boom bap on it. Get some premieres, premiere, some 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 Pete Rock style beats. I just saw a, a beautiful piece on uh um how Jay Dilla produced tracks. Rest in peace to Jay Dilla. I would be honored. Yeah, definitely thanks to Josh and Aaliyah. Um yeah, read his old school. But he be on those new school platforms, though. All right. He says he's got it. So this should be any moment now. Um, and then we can uh, uh, get it going. Uh, Black opposer workers, I guess you read yeah, I, so so I'll just share with it uh, behind the scenes. You know, pl again, please send all send anything you have a suggestion on to to that email, uh, because what I've said to Josh and Aaliyah is I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I've said, um, you know, almost actually at this point, almost thirty years, oddly enough, of of in one form or another booking guests and other stuff. I'm over it. Like it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a real pain. It's like the least favorite part of the of the of the experience. The discussions are great. Learning about new work is great. All of that is great. But the process, it's kind of like traveling. The Being in another destination is great. But the going to the airport and the lines and the this and the that and the flight and the da 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 da, -da I can't, I'm over all of that. So I've asked for their help in in in, in booking stuff. But I've said, I've, I've encouraged Josh and Leah, like, I, I don't, there are no limitations on guests. Uh, you know, I'll do as much to be prepared and and invite as much preparation support as I can get and do the best I can. But I want to be, you know, I'd, I'd love to use, have this, this, this platform and this show be where I love to learn about different people and their work and ideas that I'm not traditionally exposed to. Uh, um, and I don't think everything has to be in uh you know sort of my narrow lane of of interest and and even even uh, uh politics to a certain extent i mean we don't want you know we're not gonna get crazy with it um so as long as you know it doesn't have to so in other words we don't have to have uh somebody who is fully so-called radical or we don't have to have it connect to certain other interests that that you know necessarily if it does that's great but um so yeah, and anyway, my, my point is please just just send, you know, suggestions, uh guest suggestions, topic suggestions to to I mix what I like booking at gmail.com. I mix what I like booking at gmail.com and and we'll you know, Josh and Ali initially, and I'll, you know, we'll all get we'll get into it. Um but yeah, so that's that's it. Yeah, you know, I want them to, you know, like, I, you know, I want them to, because uh, like they're they're younger than me, Josh and Aaliyah, and they're you know um, out there doing all the stuff that younger people do in terms of graduate work and activism. So they're they're having experiences and meeting people that I'm not familiar with, and I, I you know, and reading, you know, you know. Anyway, so I want all of that. So yes, my, anyway, I went on and on, uh, but I want all of that. Um. All right, all right, all right. He should, you know, what's 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 what's. Let me let me, you know. He said he got the email, the link. Mm -mm -mm. Uh, it's all good. Are you able to join now? Oh, there he is. I think that's him. Hold up, hold up. Uh, and yes, it is. So, okay. Without further ado, everybody, you know what? Let me do. Let me do this right. Let's 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 do this right. Let me do this quick. Let's do a quick transition setup, and then we'll break. We'll be right back with Professor Reed. Don't go anywhere. I'm excited. I mix what I like. 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 All right, everybody. You know what it is. He's Adolph Reed Jr., among many other things, Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania. He has held positions at Yale, Northwestern, and the New School. 
Reed's scholarship has focused on race, American politics, and inequality. He's a contributing editor to The New Republic and has been a frequent contributor to The Nation, Harper's, and Jacobin. He's the author also most recently of The South, Jim Crow, and Its Afterlives. We now welcome once again to the platform, Professor Adolph Reed Jr. Good morning, sir. Welcome back. Good to see you. Uh, good morning, brother. Good to see you, too. Um, so thanks again for... for uh, um, uh, rescheduling, putting up with with with, with you know, my responses and and all of that, and 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 agreeing to come on. Um, and before we, you know, you're welcome to start off any way you like. But I thought we we should just start with you giving what your uh, overall summary is, uh, um, explanation uh, or description of your work. Um, you know, tell us tell us what it, what you were doing here, what you were sure. intended to do, and and then we'll go from there. Oh, great. I'll be happy to. Yeah. Uh, like I've mentioned before, I think I mentioned in the book, too, that, <clears throat> pardon me, this thing began around the end of the last century, actually. <clears throat> pardon me, when a couple of friends of mine and I, both of whom have, you know, deep south roots, uh, one about 10 years, one seven years older than I am, and the other about a decade younger. And just in a number of random conversations, sitting around talking about uh, you know, the Jim Crow era, and we started thinking that when our general cohort leaves the stage, as it were, uh, then uh, there won't be anyone else around who actually has a direct living memory of what that social order was was like, and that uh, it might be, you know, good to leave, you know, think about leaving some kind of trace record. And what I did, like after a few of these conversations. I just sat down one day and started writing with no particular end in mind um, and quickly wrote myself into a no person's land of 15,000 words, which is, you know, too long for an article and too short for a book, basically. And it sat and languished, uh, you know, there for quite quite a while. Every now and then I'd make like a half-hearted effort to get it published, uh, you know, someplace. Uh, and then once I was talking to Barbara Fields, the historian about it, uh, and she asked to read it, and then she started to nudge me to make it a book, basically. Uh, and one of the things that I wasn't uh, um, you know, especially enthusiastic about was like, but the suggestion to put more of my personal experiences in it. Uh, and I did, like, thanks to uh, Professor Fields and Faith Childs, my former agent in Manhattan, who really helped by giving me like 12 to 15 explicit suggestions. Um, I, I was able to do it, pull it off, and Verso liked the idea a lot, and um, here we are. So I mean, that's the book. What I wanted to, what, well, what I had in mind, so at the most general level, what, what I had in mind was like leaving a more textured picture of what that era was like than we normally get from either um, sort of dramatic, journalistic, or historical, uh, or historical accounts that tend to focus on you know, big issues in, in campaigns and, and the big structures, or from memoirs, which tend to focus more on personal experience. And for the record, like I've never seen this book as primarily a memoir, or even frankly, secondarily a memoir. Um, so, so what I wanted to do was like to try to convey a sense of of where the regime came from, what its defining structures were. Who, who got what out of it, how it got reproduced over time, uh, and then maybe a little bit about the pressures that began uh, you know, to un unravel it, but also how people lived within its strictures on a daily basis. So, that, so I mean, that's what my idea was for the book. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, so for me, like when, 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 when you're the, um, I, I think your publisher sent me the book last at the end of last year and I, mm -hmm. you know, and I wanted to, 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 you know, read it and have you on. Um, I like, I'm aware that with you or with anybody else, and you know, it's natural. There, there are areas where we don't agree. And I think there's, mm -hmm. there, there are, right. there are, there are, I've always thought that there are, are huge overlaps where we do agree right. and some where we don't. Um, but what really got my my you know my ire up, I have to admit, is is not what you actually what I've saw you writing in the book per se, where I do have mm -hmm. some questions and I'll ask you in a minute. Okay. But but what, it was these the subsequent appearances on these other platforms, mostly white 
semi liberal or alternative spaces mm -hmm. where th there is no tradition of, on those platforms of engaging race, the history of race, uh, arguments about race, the, the, mm -hmm. the, the race class debate, all these, they don't do any of that. And in mm -hmm. fact, do something in, in, in the case, particularly of Cigar and Jetty, do something very different. So when I saw you interviewed in, with him in particular, I think that was the one that really got me. Because <laughs> like, because as you're you're talking, he was having such a, a excited, happy experience. You could hear him. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And this is a guy that is has a very conservative, reactionary right. view of race and the right. history of racial struggle. Well, of everything and else never, for that matter. Right. And everything else. But but right. but and never talks to black people about these issues. Whenever he talks about race at all, it's usually with other non black guests. So mm. That mm -hmm. was so I, when I saw that and a couple other appearances, right. I, was, I said, so, you know, so and and then I, so my first question is specifically, um, I feel like or I guess comment, I feel like your your initial what I feel is a dismissal reference to Malcolm X to me is kind of sets the tone for your approach to the critique of race and racism and white supremacy in this book. So in other words, I get and have always agreed with you on there is a group that is always hustling on this. There is mm -hmm. always a group right. that's playing on this for their own shady. Right, sure. But but they but they shouldn't be held as as the standard for the the, the traditions and legacies of those who have raised legitimate critiques about race and white supremacy. So when you just when you just passingly refer to Malcolm X uh, uh, saying that that. Um, on the other hand, if you expressed more and more commonly as the era recedes, that is the Jim Crow era recedes in time, contends that the civil rights movement's victories were trivial. An extension of this view, which was retailed, again, retailed by Malcolm mm -hmm. X and other black race nationalists, is that the struggle against segregation was misdirected, that fighting to desegregate lunch counters and restrooms, for example, reflected a demeaning presumption that black people needed proximity to whites for their validation. And you're critical of that approach, but... I, I, as it particularly today mm -hmm. so say say so because I, I you know but why is you know initially i'm like why is malcolm right. reduced in that way like and he's right. retailing something and then he had moved you know you don't account for his his expansive internationalist politics and all that like it's just and then like, but that is seemed to be used to be right. the, the setup for the approach to the rest of the book so i'm sorry go ahead and, and oh yeah yeah well yeah uh yeah let me say first of all about those other platforms uh and I'm not, and like, this isn't a full naivete, but, you know, I don't really operate in the world, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like I go on, I listen to podcasts when somebody invites me onto one mm -hmm. and you know, I don't follow them. Um, you know, I don't know who does what, right? I mean, that's not my reference world, basically. So, so I don't know what else those people do, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and I'm not saying that's a good thing, but I'm just saying it's saying what well, I'm saying it's a fact of life. Like I know that Segar is 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 conservative. I've watched enough of that one, but mm -hmm. right to understand it. Uh, and I mean, uh, uh, and uh, and interestingly, like uh, as far as I know, like the 24 hours of Twitter, uh, when I'm um, Twitter infamy that I've ever had, as far as I know. Was when I made a passing reference um, to uh, what's her name, um, Angela Nagel, uh, mm. in, what like in the context of of, of an ultra right wing, you know, sort of deep um, effort to sort of court uh, people with uh, reputations for being uh, iconoclasts within the left mm. uh, to try to you know, you know what the Maoists used to call. Uh, um, um, to use the red book against uh, well, with the red book, and then a bunch of these people. I guess they call themselves. Yeah, I don't know what they call themselves, but but, but the red brown tendency or whatever got got on my ass, right? You know, all over Twitter for like a day. Like I'm supposed to care about uh, well, about anything that happens on Twitter. Um, so 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 I'm really just outside that stuff completely. But I will say this about the Malcolm reference. Like it was a passing reference, right? In that context, uh, Malcolm, in the moment, was a person because of Malcolm's centrality, who was most visibly identified with that argument. My beef is less with Malcolm because, as I pointed out, like in another article that I wrote on you know, on appropriation of the memory of Malcolm X, that Malcolm was actually dead before most of the stuff 
th that we uh, the big events we associate with the 1960s that actually happened and 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 what's so it's not so much malcolm as what people want want malcolm to be posthumously right right i mean that's the problem and frankly you know, even though Malcolm X made those utterances in speeches when he was alive, right? And, and I fully understand the context right there, right? I mean, I, what I mentioned to, to, to somebody else not that long ago, um, I think it was to Greg Carr a couple of days ago, that I you know, I came into the movement, what, what I came into politics through Black Power, through the Black Power movement. So I understand all that very, very well. But it's, But again, it's not so much Malcolm in real time trying to articulate a different kind of vision, right? At, as it is people subsequent to Malcolm of trying to take this idea that the, you know, that, that the 14th Amendment approach um, to fighting segregation was misguided. Uh, and partly as I go on, I believe that same point in the text to point out, I'm not sure if it's the same point though, uh, but that that the argument, the contemporary argument, that that the approach to combating segregation was wrong, and I have my own problem. What, what I, mean, I see the limits of that approach too, and I've argued about the limits of it. But what that, but what the contemporary argument that challenging Jim Crow was was wrong, and what the appropriate strategy should have been, would be uh, to fight for a more honest. In, enforcement of separate but equal fundamentally missed the point of separate but equal, right? The point uh, separate was never intended to be equal. And like the equal part was just a fig leaf tossed over a very clear violation of black Americans rights under the 14th and 15th amendments. And in some cases, 13th, but yeah, yeah. But I'm not looking to dr drag from Malcolm X, right? Uh, Cause in fact, I mean, what would the point be, right? But, but, but I don't think the, point of our politics now should be to venerate anybody in the past or or or, or for that matter anybody in the present no but i i but my point is that that mm -hmm. that in diminishing malcolm as as i as i think you do here it allows for the to set the table for where you you come later and i'm i'll, I'll ask you specifically about that in a second mm -hmm. to make these conclusions about what has occurred since jim crow has ended uh uh mm -hmm officially at least um, okay and my point is that that so for instance Malcolm even in his lifetime I don't know that I agree with you that that he didn't say more in his lifetime about even this critique of the the shortcomings of for instance uh um as you put here race nationalism Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, so like you don't account for his his for his or anyone else's expansion of a critique of the shortcomings of the civil rights movement, not necessarily to say that it shouldn't have been engaged, but that it would, there was a shortcoming. So even MLK in his lifetime said mm -hmm. his own work to desegregate the lunch counters was insufficient as right. as a goal. So right. so and it didn't satisfy all of the underlying tensions so right where now so this is where i historically you and i i felt in most agreement with you that that uh -huh. when black people ignore the class question in our analysis we're flawed we're mistaken mm -hmm. that's how i summarized right. your your argument forgive right. me right. but oh, at yeah. the same right. time you seem to have gone in completely the other way to say we have to get rid of the the uh, an analysis of white supremacy as it continues post jim crow to play an, a major role in impacting even the material lives of Black people, um, and and that's why I, that's why I'm saying I feel like what you how you set the table with with with, with Malcolm is in fact mm -hmm. a precursor to, to to that conclusion that I struggle yeah. with. Well, I guess I can see what you're saying. I mean, so like for me, the point isn't about Malcolm at all, right? Right. But and the book's not about Malcolm, right? Correct. Um, uh, but but the point is like to what well, the point of the reference to Malcolm and frankly I guess yeah I didn't even think about it that much but you know, Malcolm was on my mind partly as a person who in real time right was making a, that particular kind of criticism of the limits of the civil rights movement and 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 in my own household right my dad um, and I actually um, were in agreement that that perspective, which was not, or or the perspective that the movement was about 
being able um, you know, you know, to benefit from the luster of being close to white people. Um, while some people who interpreted the objectives of the movement, especially white, white liberals, uh, and and certain readings of the um, of the foundation of the Brown decision in 1954, and for that matter, even some black people who participated or didn't participate in the movement but supported it, did think that that was the objective. But but that wasn't the essential objective of the movement. That certainly wasn't the objective of of activists in in the movement, right? Um, and again, like when I make that that reference early in the text, but you know, I'm really not even so much thinking about Malcolm as I am thinking about people like Gary Peller and some and and uh, and some of the critical race studies law scholars and others in much closer to contemporary times who who have their own flattened reading of what the civil rights movement was what it was about and like what the institutional structures were. So I see your point. I mean and, and uh and I can see how I might have given that impression, but that really wasn't my objective. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Uh, sure. So similarly, like, so, so even similar to the point you're making um, uh, there about, like, when you're being critical of critical race theorists, particularly mm -hmm. in a moment uh, where critical race theory is is be, is popularly discussed and I think equally ignorantly discussed. Right. Um, uh, like I, the one question I wrote it as a question, but it says it seems like what what you've done here you have it's it's a data free rumination about how everything is better now. So in other words, like you you passingly make reference to some of these theorists, but I don't like. But as you said, like the book isn't like it's not uh, it's not data driven. You're not you're not you're not you're not digging in into their uh, to their work and showing right. the, how they're flawed. You're, you're you're sort of explaining their flaws with you know sort of like i i know you're saying it's not a memoir but with reflections of your own life moments in your 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 own story which i think particularly now does a disservice to the conversation so even where you might be right that i i don't agree but even where you mm -hmm. might be right in your criticism mm -hmm. it, it, it 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 it's it's it it it, it again it's it's a data free response so it's like it's not so it 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 comes across to me almost like this is to be easily misused by again the the conservatives the, the those who are never interested in real radical change or the conditions of non-white people etc because it's just it's like oh here's here's a pop prominent uh uh, 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 uh uh leading black theoretical critical scholar uh, condemning critical race theory and the way race and racism and white supremacy is discussed today. And it, it, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah. So, mm -hmm. um, but anyway, but, but just, so just real quick, for instance, you, mm -hmm. two passages I have, you say here on, on at one point, Jim Crow is gone from public accommodations and routine commercial activity and blacks and whites confront each other on equal terms as coworkers and consumers. I, I don't understand how you could reach that conclusion. Or then later in the book, you say the Jim Crow racial order has been vanquished. That is the that is clearest at the level that defines daily life and aspirations. Removal of strictures of official apartheid has radically altered opportunity structures and patterns of work, quality of life and social relations in small and large ways that aren't readily apparent to those who didn't know the old order. Working together as equals encourages socializing together, which is also un enabled by elimination of, of, of the petty apartheid of Jim Crow in, the public, in public accommodations. Occasionally, when I notice an interracial group of coworkers or friends out at, in a restaurant, bar, or the like, I recall how utterly impossible that would have been in the late 1960s, end quote. And when I so when I read that, you know, so the notes I made included in the margin I, I mentioned earlier in, in this show mm -hmm. before you got here. So, for instance, I mentioned earlier, I live in Columbia, Maryland. Mm -hmm. which was just reported again to be uh, rated as the second happiest city in which to live in the United States. Well, I got to tell my buddy, Mark, he lives there too. He should be happier than he is. Exactly. And, it, well, and as I'm sure Mark could probably tell you underneath that, for those of us who have any understanding in history with the city, know that right. that, that, that is not the reality. That, mm -hmm. that the claims of it being a utopia are not true. And in fact, it was reported even more recently, uh, uh, not as recently as that, but somewhat recently in the last couple of years, that, for instance, public school segregation in Howard County, Maryland, in which mm -hmm. Columbia is situated, right. Right. has the highest level of segregation 
in the country and mm. and rivals levels of segregation, particularly at the levels of advanced placement classes that we've ever that that ha, that has ever existed. So, in other words, even though you have a physical building where black and white children go into together, right. once they go into that building, they're segregated and have a very different educational experience. Right. Sure. So, so, so my point is, is that yes, there's a there's the 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 de jure apartheid regime has ended, right? But the material conditions have not improved. The, well, they have the, improved ultimately, but I mean, I, well, I, depending I, yeah. on the measures that you take. But see, here's the thing, man. Like, okay, not, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I don't at any point make a claim in this book that we've reached some kind of utopia, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but in my argument is pretty simple, and and it's that, and I say it at several places in the book, that one um, set of institutional structures, one regime of imposed hierarchy, right, was defeated and replaced with another and replaced with another that kind of emerged or 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 at least in its everyday racial dimensions kind of emerged over time, right, between 1965 and say 1975, right? I don't ever claim there's no more exploitation. I don't certainly don't ever claim there's no more racism, no. right? And but for instance, like my statement, and I don't want to over and, and and I try to be as careful as one can be not to be understood as over claiming about this. Right. I'm not claiming that that because the interracial groups of co-workers can go have lunch together. We've somehow hit that moment where, you know, from like the Coca-Cola commercial from an early 70s, where I want to teach everybody to sing in perfect harmony. I'm not saying that either, but I'm just saying that that this what we live through today isn't that. Right. And there are significant enough differences between this and that, that it makes sense for us to take account of them, to be able to understand either this or that. And that's that's the basic point of the book. So 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 like, OK, so like I. So I so I don't agree, for instance, that uh that this regime was defeated, I, I, I feel more like uh, I think more that it was forced into rebranding and adjusting itself mm -hmm. and what so so again when i when i'm when i'm pointing when i make my argument about material conditions i'm saying the accumulation of wealth has gone to uh, has increased and gone to a smaller percentage of the community right that is white people right uh well we still, and also and also mm -hmm. a smaller percentage of black people because don't forget wealth and income stratification among black people is higher than it is among any other ethnic group in what in the U.S. But um, the collective, yeah. and even with that reality, but that's mm -hmm. also, it's, and that's why I always say, like, we got to have class analysis. <laughs> but the overall collective, <laughs> the wealth in the overall collective is headed to zero. So, so it, it, it's not improving. So, well, so what wealth does exist is right. class divided. Right. Right. But, but overall, there isn't any in the community. So, so it, you right. know, there isn't any meaningful wealth in the community. Well, and see, here's mm -hmm. well, well, uh, well, yeah, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I'll just say, no, no, that's cool. It's cool. See, um, yeah, I mean, this is where I think our fundamental um, line of uh, line of disagreement is, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it said, I don't, um, I don't. Uh, but how should I put this? Um, well, yeah, I think yeah, I think the point you made a little while ago about um, you, you, yeah, I mean, not seeing the Jim Crow regime as having been defeated, but seeing it as having shifted, right? Uh, I think kind of points to the difference, right? Like I don't. Mm -hmm. um, so, so for me, uh, the fundamental problem isn't a generic white supremacy, right? Uh, I tend to see what white supremacy am, and I'm writing something about this now um, in kind of the same way that the fieldses do, right? That, or as I've argued elsewhere, that, that race and other um, ideologies of ascriptive difference, that is differences based on what people supposedly are instead of what they do, are ultimately, right, but I've never said they don't exist and I've never said they're not important. But what, what I have said is that they don't exist apart from capitalist hierarchy because what or, or other class class hierarchies and what 
the work that they do, right, the performative work that they do is is ultimately to mask class dynamics and class distinctions and to read them into nature, right? And that's and and, and I think that's a difference between us. That's um, that's not all that meaningful at the level of everyday practice and concerns, but it's certainly one that that sets us off like in different in, interpretive uh, or sets us off on different interpretive paths. Right. So, and, and I oh, respect, sorry, yeah. mm -hmm. well, no, I was just going to say, uh, and um, that's just what it is. Right. And, and um, you think yours is right. I think mine is right. And, and we'll figure out like which one works and, 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 uh, and how it's possible like to build a movement to make, uh, make lives better for working people of whatever sort. So, so, I guess I'm 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 looking at that the uh, uh, the article from February 12th that uh, Benjamin Wallace Wells wrote uh, about your book in the New Yorker, and oh, I think you yeah. gave him an interview for that. Right. And I, you know, because you know, uh, um, it, it, I, I talked about it on a previous you know show, but but I what I so, and this is so like, and this is what I feel like gets gets lost in in your the South book because I agree with you. So like when when this article refers to you as like the angry Marxist and and the right. guy that that you know you you have a bone to pick with the race hustlers, like I, I I feel you when you when you when when the list here includes people like Ibram Kendi, Isabel Wilkerson, and Henry Louis Gates, I'm like yeah, like like read mm -hmm. go get them, like go get them, mm -hmm. like I'm I'm right. all with you on that. Less so about Tanahisi Coates, although I got my issues mm -hmm. with him too, but less so about him and less so about um, uh, Cornell West, although we got issues with him too. You know. um, mm -hmm. But when you go after Dyson and those folks, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. These cats, mm -hmm. these, these cats, I right. think are fraudulently playing, the, playing a game here. Right. But, but, but I don't think like that comes across, like the difference, the distinction, I don't think comes across in, in, in your work here where, where others are like Malcolm X uh, historically and others today are not hustling or, or, or the word you use, retailing, uh, uh, you know, a, a struggle against well, whiteness. Well, wait, but all they, I mean about re retailing, in, yeah, or ahead, by, yeah um, all I mean by re retailing in that context is it, it, it is rehearsing the line more than once, right? And that's all I mean by it. I know, but I'm just saying the way it, I'm just saying the well, way it reads in the well, context. Well, brother, that's like, on you, man. Like, all right, well, I mean, I'm saying that's why I'm right? just telling. That's why I'm asking. It's yeah, yeah, my well, reading, and I'm asking you about it. That's it. Well, well, yeah, no, no, I hear you. I'm not getting pissed off, but I'm saying like, <laughs> yeah, like that's that's more a matter of mm. of your preset expectations, right? That mm, okay. that affect the way that you read it than it mm. is a matter of what I intended when I wrote it. But let me say something about the New York sure. piece because sure. I was not happy with that thing at, okay. at all and and okay. and in fact um you know, wallace wells if that's his name sent like it was clear he didn't quite get mm -hmm. what he was supposed to be doing because he didn't only talk to me he talked to at least a half dozen other people that i've worked closely with for a number of years and that whole right. and and it just seems like he had trouble wrapping his his arms around the subject and he just re reverted to the standard new yorker personality profile, which is the thing that I did not want in the first place, which is when I first heard from the publicist that the, that the New Yorker was interested in doing a profile on me. My first reaction was, shit, I wish I hadn't written the book, right? Um, mm. But, and I got that actually when I was, uh, uh, um, um, the night before, well, when I was supposed to do your show, show last time, and I read it. Um, and was dispirited enough by it uh, that fortunately the very next next morning, and if you haven't seen these, I would suggest these too. Um, shit, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Um, um, uh, the next morning, I got both a podcast from uh, uh, both a podcast from um, Harper's and like an interview from Common Dreams. Right. I mean, both of which are much more informative and clearer and like connected with with, with the projects of the book as I see it. Um, but like, yeah, I mean, and just to take that point another step, um, you know, I don't like 
you know, this whole thing about my rep for going on the war path, it, it, it is a product of a very historically specific moment. And this would be a good place for me to lay it out, right? Sure. Um, at the beginning of the 80s, uh, you know, after Ronald Reagan was inaugurated, and it had begun to become clear that Reagan wasn't going to be another Nixon, right? But 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 that he was a serious ideologue, and was out to undermine everything that we had won as working people, black people, lovers of freedom and equality over the previous sixty years, right? So I made a calculated political decision, which was that. And I'd never done this in my life, but which was to try to figure out a way to make common cause with liberal Democrats, right? As as part of popular front kind of approach to 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 uh, um, uh, to combating Reagan and Reaganism. And then by the late '80s, and between the late '80s and Clinton's election, right? Um, I watched the proliferation of underclass ideology, and and the demonization of mainly black poor people, right? Uh, I mean, even to the point people forget this, but I had to go up to New York last last Saturday, and frankly, I was pissed off to get off the train at, at, at Moynihan Hall because, well, whenever I think of Moynihan, like I think not only of the Moynihan report, but his comments at his Senate hearing on, on welfare reform in 1994, when he actually talked about speciation taking place among the poor, so that they were actually becoming a different species. And when I saw liberals and people who understood themselves to be leftists, right, taking up uh, you know, underclass ideology and trying to pretend that it was something that it wasn't, then yeah. I mean, that's when I just started calling people out. And I started calling people out uh, on one basic principle, right? that th these are people who had access to the public microphone in, in in a very contentious and dangerous policy moment who were using that access pimping it even like i even did a progressive column that's uh, you know, reprinted in a class notes called pimping poverty then that then, then and now which was a focus on poverty research as a new form of pimping poverty but using the public microphone to advance themselves uh, by demonizing black poor people. And and we have to remember, this was also the context in which all that anti-crime stuff stuff was happening too, right, right at the beginnings of mass incarceration. And I figured, okay, well, if, if their operation is to attack the weakest and, the and most vulnerable people in, in a society who don't have access to the public microphone, yeah, I never considered myself to be speaking for the poor or or what or or are the demonized but i figured that that one thing to do with the limited access that i had to the public microphone what was to call these bastards out for what they were and i did that strategically and intransigently and wanted uh, you know, you know, among other things like to force people to be honest about what what they were doing and also people who considered themselves to be on the left right either to put up a shut up or to be clear or stop making claims about their politics. Now, I haven't done that stuff in decades. And I haven't done it in decades uh, because th there's a different political project that, that that I've been involved in that that I think is much more, well, I know is much more important to me, but I think it's also much more central um, to the future of our movements um, and of the society by trying to build something. So among other things, what what I didn't like about uh, um, um, about the hook for that essay was that's like 30 years out of date. So is that why he threw in the the reference to Ibram Kendi and uh, Isabel Wilkerson to update it? I don't. I, I hadn't seen what you had said about them in particular, but but I, I was. That's what I assumed when he. Well, Kendi. I don't know what I said about Kendi, man, but mm -hmm. but but I feel fairly confident that what I'd say about Kendi and all that different point you would say about Kendi, but I don't think about him at, as right, a rule. Right. right. No, I was uh, just asking if, if, yeah. if, 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 if Wallace Wells referenced Kendi to, to, to your point to update 
Oh, uh, yeah. an old argument. In other words, because as you said, right. you, he was he was referencing something that was decades old. And and so when right. I read it, I actually thought you had come out to say something about Kendi and Isabel Wilkerson more oh. recently that I just oh, I had not have, seen. Well, um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I probably did say something about Kendi in, in the interview or maybe. Oh, OK, it, OK. Or, or or no, actually, maybe I think it was when he um, well, he may have gotten that from from the article that Michael Powell did in The Times. Um, okay. a couple of years ago. But uh, yeah, but the Wilkerson thing, look, um, uh, uh, you know, my only problem with her is it, 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 it is that cast cast analogy just I mean, yeah. it doesn't work. So no. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, that was, I was just asking. I, I was you know, I'm not trying to get you to go through their arguments with them. I was just asking. Right. If that's oh, yeah. why right. Wallace Wells referenced them. Um, so I mean, I, Anyway, let me let me just so the the the, the um, so one thing that I, I made a note here that I don't <laughs> think I don't think the critics of if I if I read and heard you correctly I don't think mm -hmm. the critics of um, the shortcomings of the struggle around integration are arguing or were arguing anything about a proximity to whites as much as they were arguing about the 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 ineffectiveness of separate but equal and the reality that it wasn't a, a need to get rid of segregation to be closer to white people, but the thought was we need to get rid of segregation to be closer to an ability to expand, to live, to be free of certain violence and to develop a kind of economic and political power that would correct the issues we have still to this day. Uh, and that's where they, and, and, and to that point they were saying, it's been ineffective. In other words, people mm -hmm. like Malcolm, people like Dr. King, people to this day who who um, uh, would be arguing about the 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 immutability uh, uh, to a certain extent of white supremacy in terms of how institutionally white people still deal with black people. So to mm -hmm. your point about seeing black and white people sitting and working together, one of the thoughts I had was that old quote from James Baldwin, that you don't judge racism by a personal individual experience, but you judge it by the right. treatment of the group by its institutions. And institutionally, right. are, are, obviously there are right. some differences, but but it's not fundamental enough uh, to, to for me at least, and I think right. others to say that there's been this, this post- well, yeah. Well, see, mm -hmm. but yeah, see, here's a distinction, right? That's meaningful, mm -hmm. and it's probably one that we can't, can't, can't resolve because it has to do with different starting places. Um, you're, because like we are together on the uh, argument that, um, that, um, the defeat of segregation wasn't adequate, right, to do what we need to do, and and. And the best that we could hope from it would be like to open up the society more to, to continue moving forward in whichever way we think it's appropriate to move forward. But what I was going to say about the distinction between us, it, it's like we we probably differ on how fundamental fundamental is. Right. Or what counts as fundamental. But I'm certainly also not arguing ever that um, that or, or about judging but I mean, racism by the you know, at the level of or racial inequality, right? What because I prefer to talk about that than okay than than about racism, which to me is fundamentally an idea, right? Um, but uh, but I said to me, right? Because I realized that's something more than that to you. Uh, but but my point was really a rather simple one, right? Um, that that there was a level of 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 access uh, you know, to individual interactions, right, uh, and presumption, um, qualified or not, of equal citizenship, that was not possible in 1960, that that was possible in 1970 or or, or in 1980, and, and I'm not saying anything more than that. I'm not, you know, people try to stick stick all kinds of um, maximalist claims in my mouth that I not only never make, but take great pains to make clear that I'm not trying to make. And every now and then, I'm not talking about you in this either, but um, every now and then I wonder what, God, did you read or can you read, right? I mean, but, uh, and I'm absolutely not 
not not talking about you in this because I understand. No, I wouldn't. I, but, honestly, I would. Yeah, that'd be fine. I don't. Well, but I, well, but, well, I, but, yeah, but I wouldn't do that anyway. Like, but my point is because like like we like for instance even on that the issue of the reference to Malcolm we we mm -hmm. you're but see, you Malcolm are saying that, that I'm misreading you so no, no, I got no. you I, but, yeah. but yeah uh, but yeah, it's one reason and, I mentioned Malcolm is mm -hmm. that I recall Malcolm saying at the time right uh, or or I'm mean, disparaging what with the idea of of the desegregationist wing yeah. of of the movement by saying. Uh, by um, attributing to them a desire to sit next to white people on the toilet, right? Yeah, and, but there was also and, a critique but it was that a he had later. Flourish. Okay, right. Go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, see, but see, but again, like the point of this book for me, right? Uh, you know, isn't to valorize or to demean Malcolm uh, no, and Malcolm's yeah. reference at at that point to me was 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 just an illustration of a tendency that's that's not again not so much a tendency that i associate with a malcolm but but with like the legions of people who who think that that who who've constructed a version of malcolm that that they want to act out i remember i think it was the last poet said once um people uh love love to hear Malcolm rap, but they didn't love Malcolm. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, and, and, I, and certainly, you know, I, on some level, I definitely am, uh, am, am either guilty of what you're saying or could be described as being in that camp because I didn't know him or was alive mm -hmm. when he was alive. But, right. but I, I do feel a certain level of confidence that it, when, when reading him, reading about him, listening mm -hmm. to him, that he had evolved a criticism that moved sure. I don't want to say just beyond, but differently from where you're describing it. And right. that's my, and so yeah. I'm only bringing him up to make the point. I'm not bringing him up because I'm saying you, you, the book obviously is not about him, but I keep referencing him in, in your reference to him, because I think that is again, the frame that you bring to this, to the, that version of Malcolm. So in other words, when Malcolm would make overt, uh, 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 condemnation of the shortcomings of segregate of, of the uh, anti-segregation movement because of, for instance, the intractability of white supremacy, of capital, mm -hmm. of imperialism, right. like that. Right. That element of your argument, of his argument, doesn't appear here. And when you talk about the people who are 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 fraud are, are mistakenly referencing Jim Crow in in a comparison to today, you you don't account for I think the 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 Again, the hustlers are one thing, but they're, mm -hmm. you don't account for the the beautiful and sophisticated and brilliant analyses that are still being performed that are not meaning to in a hustler way say blah, 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 but are saying mm -hmm. this whiteness or racial inequality, racism, white supremacy, mm -hmm. whiteness, whatever you want to would have is 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 uh, um, uh, demonstrating an immutability, a, a, a protractability that if you wanted to to discredit or demean, I think that that it deserves more than um, memoir adjacent reflections or something like that. Like I think so that's well, all I'm see, saying. So, well, see what I'm saying, brother. Okay. Though is okay. Yeah, is I think that you're assuming. Um, well, one thing. What well, what I'd say is I think that we probably differ on our um, assessments of the beauty and the brilliance of those arguments. So that's another issue. <laughs> but, uh, but again, like, um, well, but see, I hear you. Uh, well, but I hear what you're saying. But, but, but see, from my perspective, like, this is a debate, right, that I, that I'm not part of and have no, I, and have no interest in being part of, right. And my, hmm. and, and, and my objectives with, with this book are really pretty simple, right. Um, hmm. And, and uh, so, like, I'm not looking to validate any uh, you know, particular way of of, of, of uh, arguing about um, the perpetuity of of a white supremacy. Like, I'll do that other places. Right? I'm trying to write an argument about that now. Uh, but, but with the compass, right? Like the interpretive compass, like of this book, is really much more narrow. So, okay, right on. So, so lastly, I did want to say, like, I, you know, mm -hmm. I, as I've said publicly before, you were here, uh, you know. Uh, um, Again, I'm not without ego. 
uh, mm-hmm. and, and certain sense of confidence or whatever. But I do acknowledge that there are, as Wu Tang famously said, levels to this. And I did, <laughs> and I would have preferred that you had this discussion, for instance, with a Gerald Horn or somebody. Uh, I think you know mm-hmm. whose who's work via sixteen nineteen project you've been critical of at least, and who who's. I, I, for lack of a better way of saying it, at your level, more at your mm-hmm. level than than certainly I am. He didn't want to do it. I did ask him. He didn't mm-hmm. want to do okay. it. And I and I and I kind of. So I don't know if you all have have ever had an exchange or have any. Not a bad one because I. Not no. I mean, but it, it, I'm not. Uh, I don't even I, think the disagreement I, is. A, but I, but, yeah. I, but and so I would like in a lot of ways. Say, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that is in a lot of ways. Like for most of our careers, as I understand it, we, we've been more like allies than we have been antagonists. Sure. So. No, but I know. So, so specifically in the email I sent to him, I was asking him if, if given your criticism of the sixteen nineteen project mm-hmm. and his participation in it, if mm-hmm. you all could come on and talk about those differences, because uh, um, again, where you and I disagree on this on this mm-hmm. issue here, I do right. have again at least some level, if not a good amount yeah. of level of, of agreement with you on your mm-hmm. critique of the 1619 project for its absence of a class analysis, if I'm not mm-hmm. over, if I'm right. close enough to. Yeah. yeah, 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 definitely. And given Gerald Horn's class-based historical, you know, so I was like, he would, uh-huh. I don't, I, I would love for, that should be the conversation. So I guess just in, in closing for now, at mm-hmm. least, and, and you're always, always uh, look forward to doing more and coming back um, uh, again, having you back again. Um, just if you would say something about your issues with the 1619 project and maybe as part of a of a concluding comment about again you know just clarifying mm-hmm. my my disagreements or, or misreadings notwithstanding what right. what you really do want to people to understand about what you're saying here right okay well yeah i mean let me um yeah uh, if you don't mind um uh, let, no, let, let me all. say say one of the sure uh, bring attention to one small small thing before that so I did, I mean, I don't know if you saw this. If you didn't, like, I'll send it to you when we get off. Um, but I did an article back in the summer um, called The Whole uh, the whole Country is the Reichstag, right? And it's an argument about how how grave, I think, you know, the actual danger of an authoritarian or slash fascist takeover is. And one thing that drives me crazy about leftists, and by the way, I don't really associate with them either, um, and I mean, least of all politically, but is that, that there's this tendency, especially among you know, academic sorts, uh, that once the prospect of fascism comes up, to jump into trying to taxonomize whether uh, you know, current uh, expressions of a dangerous right wing qualify for the fascist label on that, and then people start jerking off about you know their understanding of shit that happened in Italy in 1920 or whatever. When when uh, my take on that is that. Once the question arises as something to think about, then we're well past the point of taxonomizing it, and the only thing that they do is to uh, that, that that there is to do is to try to figure out ways to fight against it, right? And I've and I've been convinced that we aren't, you know, um, I put it someplace like one 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 night oversleeping away from missing a fascist coup, right, uh, or an authoritarian coup. So, and I mentioned that to say, and I will send you. But, but the link to this article, but I mentioned that to sure. say that that's where my principal concern is now. Uh, and what I think this is a clear and present danger like in American society. And and if something like that happens, black people are gonna get the short, shortest end, end of the stick. So it's a real issue for us also. And to that extent, you know, all the rest of this stuff, right, is like secondary to me, mm. right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, all the rest of it, debates over the 1619 project, um, right, all that stuff, right? Um, but um, but my basic problem with it is, my principal problems with it are really um, that it's flat as a history. It, it's a flat as a history, right? Because uh, the history of American slavery and anti-slavery is more dynamic and, and, and complex than than that account uh, mm. provides for, right? And that has con- payoffs for contemporary politics because there's something to me, and see, this is what I don't like about Afro-pessimism, right, for instance, right? I mean, but like that sensibility is one that presumes a full lunch pail 
and health insurance and good benefits, right? Because um, that's only when you can afford, well, those are the only circumstances under which you can afford the luxury of, of feeling that we're just consigned to be the victims of what of the white supremacy, no matter what, and and, and uh, forever, right? And 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 one of the things I've been kicking myself about is that, you know, back in the '80s when I was at Yale and would sort of point to class dynamics among Black people, some of my colleagues, you know, um, you know, would say to me, kind of self righteously, well, but you know, Adolf, you have to understand that there's more to life than just political economy or than just I mean, economics. And I was too genteel to say, well, that's easy for you to say, isn't it, right? Because you've got this job for life and the benefits and the rest of it, right? Uh, and, and you know, most people in this country you know, have to work for a living and Blacks and Hispanics more so than anybody else. And it just seems to me that uh, uh, that the key issues, well, that that a political program that basically comes down to a version of there's nothing we can do is a program that leads you like into the arms arms of the ruling class. And, and that's why I've been arguing that much of what we understand as anti-racist politics at, at this moment uh, is like in effect the like agency of, of, of uh, neoliberalism. And I'm trying to finish up a little essay about that too that I'll send you one. I look forward to reading that again. So, so in terms of this, the way we read things, again, I have never read it, specifically Frank Wilderson's work. I've never uh -huh. in our interviews. I have never once, and and we even clarified that in our most recent interview. I have never uh -huh. once come away with "there's nothing we can do," and we're just always going to be victims. That I think is a that I think is a misreading of the argument. Okay. Well, I've read um, some of it, so I'll read some more. But but I, you know, but again, you know, so, but again, but so, so, but this is kind of what I feel like you, you're doing in, in, in the South. So I look forward to reading. I just need to keep reading, but, 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 but I, is that there's a conflation happening between the race hustlers, the Afro pessimists. Well, but see the race and hustlers the, and the Afro pessimists. The black don't... materialists. No, well, but I'm saying that they're into this book at all, right? I mean, this book is a simple account of of everyday life in a Jim Crow South. No, 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 but I, but no, but they but but there is you do make you do again the, the 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 in the in the in the you bring up Malcolm X to talk about his lasting his lasting negative impact on the analyses of younger generations. So what I'm saying is that even in that setting up you, you're, you're, I think there's a, a conflation of the people you have a problem with, with other people who uh, are, are doing something very. So again, there's a difference. I, I happen to agree largely with what Frank writes, mm -hmm. but there's a difference between what he's saying and what, uh, uh, you know, uh, Ajamu Baraka and Daruba Bin Wahad are saying. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between, you know, what 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 uh, what he's saying and what I'm saying. Even mm -hmm. there's a difference. You know, there's so, in other words, there's all these. There are peoples who who have an analysis of race and race and, and racial equality, white supremacy, who are doing something different with it that I don't think is accounted for in in your book here, and that I think. But, has, but 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 okay. but but they're not in the book, right? But, right, that's not the but point they, of the book, right? That's but not, you say it is. That's not you the say point that the book. point. But you say that the point of the book is to tell, give people a more accurate understanding of what Jim Crow really was, yeah, so they can right. see that today it isn't. Right. Well, and see, and uh, one, yeah, one last point yeah. about this because I sure, think that's okay. Yeah, I think this is another sort of marker of s significant difference, right? Okay. Uh, because when I talk about Jim Crow, I'm talking about something historically specific, right? I'm not talking about uh, an historically transcendent commitment to white supremacy, right? I'm talking about a particular 60 to 70 year, depending on where you were, governing order, right? That prevailed in, in most of the former Confederacy, if not all of it, right? Mm -hmm. And it had to do with some specific measures, right? That 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 were rooted in policies and practices, right? Mm -hmm. Codified r racial subordination and hierarchy. Yeah, I, I have never once argued that that racial subordination and and hierarchy no longer exist. Well, what I have argued is that they don't exist in codified ways, and I think that there's there's more significance to that distinction than other people. I think probably you 
think there is, but that's, but in some respects, that's, that, that, that's a, um, what that's a stipulated distinction based, based on how we understand the importance of the institutions and political structures. So, I mean, it, so from my perspective, it makes perfect sense to say, well, Jim Crow at, as, as that existed from point A to point B, and then after point B, it didn't exist anymore. But I never have once said that hierarchy and inequality and, 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 and injustice went away. But I do think that, that, that the systemic, um, the, the systemic dynamics through which hierarchy and inequality are re reproduced matter. And, and they matter for how we think about political options and what ways to approach trying to overcome them. That's all. Okay. To Listen, be continued, Professor, brother. Absolutely. And listen, okay. I, I, again, I want to say to you publicly, I, you know, I, I always appreciate when, when, when folks, uh, when we have a disagreement, folks are willing to come on and talk with me and, and, uh, and I, 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 I'm grateful that you did. And I look forward to another discussion in the future and yeah. to reading more of your work. Um, well, so, well, and like uh, I said, man, I've always appreciated and, uh, and enjoyed our uh, conversation. So, and, and like this right one on. too, by the way. Right on. Me too. So I appreciate right, very it. Good, Professor man. Reed, we'll, we'll catch you another time. Thank you yep. again. Thanks for any time. Yep. All right, Take brother. Care. Take care. All right. Peace now. All right, everybody. Big thanks to Professor Reed. Um, if if uh, I think I think I have a few minutes if folks want to uh, raise questions that that or make comments. Um, and even if you want to to uh, what I'm going to do is is take a quick break. And if uh, and in fact, if anybody wants to, uh, I'm putting the studio link in the chat. And if anybody wants to jump on and raise a comment or a question, uh, you're welcome. Uh, otherwise, I'll read a few comments in, in chats and see what I can, uh, uh, you know, deal with for a few minutes, and then we'll we'll get out of here and have a good weekend, right? 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 Anyway, uh, quick break. Back in just a second. Don't go anywhere. Much more coming up right here at I Mix What I Like. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Appreciate you. Uh, at least most of you, good number of you have stuck around. Uh, uh, nobody has jumped in the studio. Uh, so let's see. Uh, if you want, I mean, if you want, um, I'll put the link back in there. Uh, let's see. What did you want? Uh, yeah, I, honestly, I'm not that clear on that either. So I'd like, I look forward to checking out. Um, yeah, we had a good crowd this morning. So make sure, please, everybody like, share, subscribe, all that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> what's up, Jackie? <laughs> uh, well, there's good. We got a replay. You can always check the replay. Um, if I read, I point out Jim Crow is backed by indiscriminate organized state sanctioned violence, including rape of black. Re but 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 Todd, how would this have helped his argument? Because that same state-sanctioned violence is still going on. Violence is still going on. Anyway, 
I know the chat was fire. I could I could only dip in every once in a while. I didn't want to lose lose focus and not pay attention. Um, oh, this. Ooh, ooh. Hey, who who knows a good? Who is the best Sylvia Winter scholar? Let's get them on here. Oh. D Noble in the building. What's up, my man? <laughs> What's going on, brother? I just wanted to good say, to man, thank, good to see you and good to be seen. This was a super dope um discussion. Thank you so much for facilitating um this platform. I thought um I think you did a really good job raising like really dope principle arguments and critiques against Reed. Um, I was uh checking out you all's engage and also trying to read the uh the comments in the chat at the same time, which is really <laughs> difficult because this is a really productive chat, a lot of smart people in there uh going in. Um, one thing that I'll say is um I think what you did really best is challenge Reed on like rhetorically. <laughs> you know, what I'm I think he just leaves himself very vulnerable at times uh to make to have his arguments be perceived like really badly. Um, I've gotten mm -hmm. a lot of good value um, out of his work, but I've shared a lot of those critiques in terms of just like rhetorically how he frames his arguments and sets them up. And I think you did a really good job pushing and challenging him to let him know like you're leaving yourself open or vulnerable to these particular types of interpretations that I think undermine the point uh, that you are really trying to advance and in the, the politics that you are you're really trying to advance. So I'm hoping that he um, was really digesting <laughs> um, that that feedback. Um, I, I couldn't really tell if he was. At a couple points, it seemed like he he acknowledged it, but I thought um, ways in which you really challenged him very precisely, you know, on what his text wasn't saying or what it was saying, and then the type of interpretations that it, it makes him vulnerable to um was really good so so thank you for that and I, I thought it was just instructive for people watching like this is how you principally <laughs> engage your argument uh secondly real quick i will say and you know i might catch some fire uh for this because i think a lot of folks in the uh, comments uh what was a feeling read but i actually do agree with his point about um the jim crow regime uh being dismantled i think he's making a solid point in terms of like that it's not represented the same way today. To your point, I think the material conditions have are, are not the same and maybe even have worsened. So I think you use the language of like rebranding, right? So, um, but, uh, you know, so I definitely think that uh, anti-Black racism or white supremacy has updated its technological tools to continue to produce horrid material conditions for the masses of working class Black folks. But I do think there's a value in what Reed is trying to do when saying like Jim Crow was something very specific and the way that anti-Black racism functions today is something very different than that. And we need to be able to grapple with those distinctions to be able to best understand like how we're going to combat, you know, racism and class oppression so we can get free. And lastly, I'll say, I think there's some other folks that, uh, actually helping to advance Reed's point. I think like what Robert Allen does in um, uh, uh, Black Awakening in Capitalist America, particularly that chapter on a uh, corporate imperialism versus Black liberation, he actually has a, a passage in there, I'm, I'm go not going to remember it verbatim, but he says the racism that functioned for a adolescent capitalism could not be maintained you know what I'm saying, for a mature capitalist society. And what Robert Allen is really getting that in that in that chapter is ways in which the ruling class and corporate elites understood that Jim Crow white supremacy couldn't be maintained because blacks would no longer be docile to it. And all those rebellions, they it was an intervention. They they realized they needed an intervention on us so America was going to be ripped apart. And so I think like that shows like this the material kind of point where there was this dismantling of Jim Crow white supremacy and it was a direct result of black rebellions and and and, and mass protests and insurrection and so I think that's a real clear point to, to understand because that's black agency that's black rebellion that helped lead to the the the, 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 the dismantling of Jim Crow white supremacy now of course they found a way to update it 
you know, to now produce even more horror material conditions. But I think right, Reed is right to kind of articulate that point. So I, I just wanted to say that, but this is a super brilliant and dope discussion. And thank you, brother, for facilitating this. No, man, thank you, man. And thank you for all your work. And make sure you put in the chat where people can find you and your work. Uh, uh, one of the, the best spoken word poets out there doing it, activists, organizers, thinkers. So, so I, I, you know, please, you know, and, and we get in, come on back anytime, man. We're going to, we got to, we got to do something again. And I, I hope you saw that Net for Freeman was shouting you out uh, uh, and talking about how you had been on his Voices with Vision show some time ago or something like that. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. Anyway. You know, good to see you, man. I appreciate that. And and I and I, I I mean I so so my thing. What I would have the one thing I would have liked to to remember to say directly to Reed to your point real quick, D Noble is. I wish he would have written this book with the idea in mind of saying I want to explain the differences between Jim Crow and today, but in the context of showing that change that you're talking about, as opposed to where it reads to me as you know kind of like the old man saying it wasn't it's not as bad as it used to be and y'all need to get over it and move on with your old racist, you know, that's how like it's like you know so somebody I, I can't remember where it was earlier in the chat somebody said that i misread that and i was going doing too much or something and, and i was being unfair to him in the way i want people to read me correctly uh and that i guess that's possible i i, I as i said to him i may have misread him but that's how i read it uh, and my issue with how people misread me is that is really that they're not reading me and misrepresenting the argument on other platforms, specifically to Dr. Carr. That was my point with him, that you're not reading the work and misrepresenting the argument in its entirety without me present on another platform. So that's a huge difference between that and what's going on here. But anyway, D, I appreciate you, man. Thank you very much, man. Anytime, man. Good to see you. All right. Peace. Um. Yeah, I'll post the link in there. I got a few more minutes. If I think if if folks want to jump in uh, and 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 you know get in, let's go. I don't have a problem with that. Uh, it could have been anyone. Yeah, right, 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 right. right. Um, now, who said? Now, where did I get that? Like, I can't. Oh, that was the other thing that D Noble pointed. Like, I don't remember where I'm getting this, or if I'm even remembering it correctly. So I could use some help on that. But I feel like. Um, in terms of that shift, that there was also an overt discussion in terms of the ending of, of, of de jure segregation, where it was understood by the capitalist elite. I want is this Baran and Sweezy? No, I don't know. Anyway, that that the that the capitalist elite was was overtly discussing with itself, similar to the way the plantocracy was discussing an end to slavery, that there needed to be a way that we're going to end this on our terms and not on theirs. So um anyway all right eric w and pascal i don't know did you mean to come on together or or do we need to do this one at a time or can we all talk together i don't know what was happening here but 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 right, whoever wants to you know eric i thought i saw you first but whatever go ahead yeah or, peace 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 and greetings to black power me the peace peace and greetings to uh eric w and shout out to jab ball for having a very very excellent debate and discourse with uh, Adolf Reed Jr. And I yes, like, I, I like I like to disagree. I like I like to see the heat. I'm a, I'm a fan of the heat. I like to bring it, and I like those who like to bring it. Um, I think that my position in watching the debate is that I respect Jared Ball's position, and I understand why fundamentally there's a disagreement with Reed. And I want to say a couple of things. And I'm and I people who know my work and read my work know I'm a I'm a big fan and supporter of the Reeds. So they've had significant influence in my political development. And my access to them is a product of being mentored directly by Bruce Dixon, who was much more in line with Adolph Reed than people would really want to know if they actually talked to Bruce Dixon for longer periods of time personally. And my position is that, um, one, there are large numbers of people who have critic, who are critics of Adolph Reed, not because of what Adolph Reed says, but who it says, who he's saying it to. And I've actually challenged Reed on this. I said, listen, man, your political tradition, and I call it the Reed political tradition, is too valuable to black people to be talking to these worthless sock damn crackers, quite frankly. And that you should talk to more black people because I, I've read that damn near every book you've read and your stuff is fire. And frankly, because most of the black folk who are engaging you now 
only know you from the YouTubes, they see you on Jacobin, they tend to have a negative opinion on your scholarship because they haven't read your stuff. And the only book they know about you is Class Notes. And that's the most mediocre thing, quite frankly, in terms of the stuff you put out. A.O. Green has been writing fire stuff about black politics for 50 years. You know, read the black, read um, Black Particularity Reconsidered that he wrote in 1973. But most people don't know that because they're stuck on what they see about him in YouTube clips. Most people don't know that when most Negroes were talking about how pull up your pants in the 80s, most Negroes were talking about how the urban underclass was, was a problem. People like Orlando Patterson, people like uh, um, 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 that other sociologist. Who, right. But you know, Pascal, because we got other people want to jump on, I just want to say that's my point. Having read myself a good amount of Reed's work, this doesn't do that work justice, and I think it's too easily being misused by those who have ignoble interests and purposes. I will say this. I will say this. I, I, this is why I don't think you're totally wrong in that I would have liked Adolf to have had more of a data analysis to say, and this is where, Jared, you and I may disagree. I don't believe that we're in a post-Jim uh, Crow utopia, but I do believe that for a certain class of Negroes, things got much better than it was before Jim Crow. Okay, you know I, right, but that, and who cares about a class? I'm talking about the well, collective. What I'm is, and this is where yeah. you and I would disagree. I, right. I, I know I disagree. I think that the idea of collective black community is a charade, and it's always <laughs> been a charade. All right, okay. You know, it's always okay. been a charade. And I think that what we have is a captured politics of Negro elites that I know, I affiliated with them through organizations who have been ventriloquists for the black masses pretty much since the rise of Booker T. Washington to get paid. And most black people get ground to powder. But that doesn't end before or after Jim Crow. It was happening during Jim Crow. All right, Prescott, I appreciate it, man. I, I, you, 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 I, but... I, okay, I don't agree with that, but I don't. I don't want to. We. I. I don't want to take. I want to let Eric get in and other people get in. So I. You know, if drop whatever else you want to say, and then maybe we can no, have I'm this discussion that. another I, time. I, I mean, listen. I appreciate the fire you were bringing. I appreciate. It. I liked it. I, I, I liked the fire. I thought it was good. I think what Reed is basically saying is that, well, listen. For all the cats who are my age and younger who were born after the 1968 who think that integration is what destroyed black people, let me take you back to Mississippi in 1954 and tell me if you feel that way. And what I'm saying is that my position- And I would say to him, go to any hood or black community that you I all say don't good. exist anymore. I, I and they're not trying good. to hear that. They'd be like, look I, at what I'm dealing with yeah, right now. Yeah. And, 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 and again, they will say that because they haven't been to Mississippi in 1954. And nobody in Mississippi been to the hood in Baltimore today. So what why would people? To, but but why should somebody in the hood today be what like? At least I'm not in Mississippi. Folk, that doesn't even work. That doesn't make Come on, Jerry. Okay. Come on, Jerry. We know black folk who are living in Mississippi who are dealing with the hood in Mississippi right now. Who live both okay. lives. And that's why I'm saying I, I don't think that that group of people that you all are saying doesn't exist anymore is saying at least we're in some better moment. I don't no, think overwhelmingly was, that's support. I'm but okay. Saying, what I'm saying is that it's better for a segment of black folk. Sure. It got worse for another segment of black folk. But it, but the, the, for me, the only thing that happened is that it clarified the class contradictions that had already existed in black communities anyway. Fair enough. Right on, man. Okay, Pascal. I appreciate you, man. All right. One love. Shout out to Black One love. Media. Thanks. And watch <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate you, podcast. man. <laughs> Get that plug in, my man. Go ahead, Eric. What's up, man? <laughs> well, to, f f how do you follow that, right? But no, I, I, I think one of the things that just, again, just uh, I don't really have a dog in this fight. Um, you know, just I think the best example that you can give of what uh, another particular group is going to through is what another particular group is. You know, you see kind of the same patterns. You know, I'm I happen to be half white, half Mexican. Um, I've seen the same thing in the Latino community. Um, you know, you see the separation. That's why I like what, what Adolf said. You know, it's those who work for a living versus those who don't. I mean, and we have kind of a saying, well, yeah, I see rich folk. They can worry about the end of the world. But we, those that have to work for a living, God, we got to worry about the end of the month. Frankly, a lot of us for the end of the, the, end of the week. So, you know, um, and I think the other thing is it's like a lot of things have been weaponized. You know, so you take that weaponization of, well, OK, like what Adolf's saying. Well, yeah, that's used as a weapon to then what? 
then well, yeah, so that therefore you should be okay with your situation. Bullshit. That's not, I mean, okay, I may be cognizant of how things have changed. And in fact, things may have changed, but don't use that as a weapon to then now I'm supposed to feel good about my poverty. No, that's not it at all. And I uh, just, I see that happening with a lot of different, with a lot of different groups of people, uh, especially poor people. Well, I mean, Hey, after all, you have an iPhone. That means you're rich. Well, you have you know, a refrigerator that that means you're, you're okay. You're better off than people in the 18th, 19th or whatever it's centuries. Wait a minute. How, again, in, in the context of where we are now, how the hell does that, again, how, wh what sense does that make? Cause it's like you were saying, you know, you, you tell that to somebody, you know, in the hood or somewhere, it's like, you know, like white privilege. You go tell that to a coal miner in Appalachia. He's probably going to knock your goddamn block off. But, you know, I think what I liked about the discussion today is that you can have reasoned disagreements. Reasonable people are going to differ reasonably about things when there's doubt involved. And you can actually have constructive dialogue without going at each other's throats or thinking that the other the other's the enemy. Right. And I think that's also weaponized where, well, yeah, see, he thinks a little bit different than you. He sees the world a little bit different than you. You're, you, you need to go after it. Well, well, we're going after it, each other, right? We're still letting these guys get away with not paying taxes, um, tainting the political system, installing their own stooges, you know, as judges, as aldermen, as, uh, you know, city councilmen. Um, that, how about that? Because we can, we can do two, a, a few things at once. And just, that's just kind of my, from an outsider, if you will, perspective, how I kind of, for, for the what it's worth, so. All right, now, Eric, I appreciate it. Um, and, yeah, thanks for coming through. Appreciate it. And uh, All right, uh, continue the good work. Stay safe, man. Appreciate it. You too. Take care of yourself. Um, I actually read more with Reed here. Uh, that's funny. Uh, or you meant Pascal. Okay, right, right, right. Okay. Um, no, I mean, to the extent I understood what Eric is saying, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I get at least part of the point that, 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 uh, that he was saying that, that, and this is, I think what I was somewhat saying to read that, that there is a weaponization of his argument that I think could be reduced if he had made it differently. And to Pascal's point, I think if he had made the argument with specifically with a black audience in mind, which I don't think he did, um, it might have uh, done something. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, anyway, but I appreciate uh, Reed coming through. I appreciate all of you coming through. I appreciate those of you who jumped on with me this morning. Uh, and if anybody else wants to real quick, please do. Otherwise, um, you know, we can wrap and, and uh, uh, get ready for all that's coming up on the platform later. I know Jackie's going to be here and on, um, on BAM, uh, I believe, later. So definitely check her out. Uh, warrior class tomorrow, Sundays on Sunday, and I'll be back on Monday with, um, it might, I don't actually know yet. We haven't set it up yet, but, but we'll see. There, there might be some, some, some more follow-up on the, um, Palantir and, uh, uh, surveillance state and some other stuff, but we'll, you know, anything else. Um, well, 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 Dr. Ty Stephen Burroughs. That's a heavy compliment coming from you. I appreciate it. Um, all right, appreciate that, appreciate that. Anyway, the chat is is almost infectious. I can see why it's, it's hard to get out of here once you get in there. It's just, you know. Um, anyway, anyway, I appreciate you all. I appreciate Professor Reed. Again, if, if you are seeing this uh, in, in its replay or hearing it later on, uh, we definitely want to hear from you as well. So like my man Pierre over at Comedy Hype says. Put it in the comments. And we'll check you out next time here at I Mix What I Like and throughout the rest of the BPM platform. Peace, like Fred Hampton used to say, if, only if, you're willing to fight for it. Catch you next time. I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. What I like.